Good afternoon and welcome to the joint general session of the ISO Board of Governors and WEIM Governing Body. Please note that all audience microphones are muted until the public comment portion of the call. We will give you instructions on how to enter the queue at that time. With that, I'll turn the call over to Roger Collington. Please go ahead. Thank you and welcome everyone to the ISO Board of Governors and WEIM Governing Body Joint Meeting today. Um, I'm gonna to start out with the roll call, but before I do, I just wanted to kind of let everybody know that we do have a full, very robust schedule today. And so we're gonna to try to try to move it along and, and make sure everyone gets their opportunity and you know go at a, at a um, efficient pace. Let's leave it at that. So with that, let me start with the roll call. Um, and this is in alphabetical order for the, the governing body and the, uh, and the um, Board of Governors. Chair Bhagwat? Present. Governor Bornstein? Present. Member Campbell? Present. Member Decker? Present. Governor Galitova? Present. Vice Chair Gardner? Here. Chair Konziolka? Present. Vice Chair Leslie? Present. Member Prescott? Present. And Governor Shorey? Present. Thank you. We have a full complement of the governing body and the board and a full quorum on each end. Uh, next, let's, let me turn it to the, our chairs for their brief uh, welcoming remarks today. Chair Konzioka? Thank you, Roger. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of the Western Energy Imbalance Market Governing Body, I'd like to extend a warm holiday welcome to everyone for the December 2022 joint meeting of the Board of Governors and Governing Body. I appreciate your attendance and interest in today's meeting. Thank you, Chair Konzioka. Chair Bagua. Uh, thank you, Roger. Um, again, also welcome on behalf of the Board of Governors. Um, we have, a, as Roger said, a very full agenda today and more exciting things coming up in the next year. So um, I think I'm gonna keep that as brief as possible. Thank you, Chair Barwood. I didn't cut you off, did I, Chair Gonsioka? No, you did oh, not. I, I, in my, in more... my zeal of efficiency. No, no, um, you, were expecting, you were expecting more, but good. I'm gonna- well, I'm gonna well. just keep moving, moving right along. This is a Swiss watch today, sir. Mm -hmm. So uh, next we have up the, um, the vote on the um, joint general session minutes for October 26, 2022. And I would ask for a motion on that. So moved. moved. I'm sorry, was that Anita the first, yeah. I think? Thank yeah. you, Anita. And um, second? Second, Jan. Thank you, Jan. And I am gonna take your vote individually because of the virtual world we're in. Chair Bagua? President, uh, yes, sorry, hi. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, we'll, 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 we'll take anything. Uh, Governor Borenstein? Aye. I like that. Member Campbell? Aye. Member Decker? Aye. Governor Galitova? Aye. Vice Chair Gardner. Aye. Uh, uh, Chair Konzioka. Aye. Vice Chair Leslie. Aye. Member Prescott. Aye. And Governor Shorey. Aye. Thank you. The, uh, the motion passes with uh, each body five votes. Moving right along. Agenda item, agenda item number two is our decision on, oh, that's, that's where I'm at. I'm moving backwards, apparently. Uh, agenda item number three is our decision on the WEIM resource sufficiency evaluation enhancements phase two. And before I turn it over to Anna McKenna, our vice president of market policy and performance, let me know that we did receive a public comment letter on this item from NV Energy and that letter has been uh, transmitted to both the board and the governing body. Anna? Well, good, thank you, Roger, and good, after, good afternoon, uh, Board of Governors and governing body members. 
Um, I'm very pleased today to be presenting to you this item and Danny Johnson, our Mark Design Sector Manager, will shortly be providing you the details of the present of our proposed changes. But I wanted to take a quick moment to thank all stakeholders um, and for their participation in this initiative. You know, earlier this year, we spent a lot of time analyzing and looking into the uh, consequences of resource efficiency evaluation failures as well as what goes into it. And it's been a long process. Uh, and I just wanted to thank everybody for their involvement in this. It's been a good uh, discussion. This proposal uh, does respond to some of the issues that were raised earlier this year, in, in addition to the guidance provided to us to uh, seek for an alternative uh, for failures of resource efficiency evaluation that provides the opportunity for uh, failures, uh, sorry, for accessing transfers when um, resources, uh, systems are constrained. Um, but we're not uh, obviously done. We continue to work on the resource efficiency evaluation. In the future, we will uh, make some additional uh, changes to our design as we learn more. But this proposal is ready for us to present to you. And it is a proposal that we are hopeful can be implemented by next summer, which is one of the requests that was put forth to us. Um, with that context in mind, I will turn it over to Danny. He'll get into the details of this and um, uh, present to you our proposed changes. Okay, thank you, Anna. So I'm here today to present on the resource efficiency evaluation phase two decisional item. This is the second time this year the ISO is asking for your approval and making enhancements to the RSE. The motivation behind the second phase of the proposal is really twofold. First, it's to respond to guidance that the ISO received at the joint governance meeting in February relating to trying to utilize the WEIM to further increase real-time reliability. The second item is to resolve outstanding policy concerns that were raised in the phase one development. Now, management is proposing several enhancements that increase the reliability of the WEIM balancing authority areas. Two of these enhancements fall under the joint authority of the WEIM governing body and the ISO Board of Governors. Uh, the first of these enhancements provides for assistance energy transfers for WEIM areas that have failed the resource efficiency evaluation. The second enhancement ensures that the resource efficiency evaluation only considers each balancing authority area's demand and firm export obligations. A final enhancement falls under the WEIM governing body's advisory role. This change looks to align the tagging rules uh, of market products that can be purchased out of the ISO market with the quality of those products. So management is proposing a new assistance energy transfer service for WEIM areas that fail the resource sufficiency evaluation. We believe this allows the WEIM to provide reliability benefits to capacity or flexibility deficient balancing authorities. The assistance energy transfers are subject to an after the fact surcharge. The after the fact surcharge will not be utilized within the market's optimization. Rather, a BAA opting to utilize this functionality would not have their transfers limited, as is the status quo, and the surcharge as described in the memo would be applied to the market results. Now, assistance energy transfers are proposed to be priced at a single tier. We recognize and agree with concerns that have been raised by the MSC, the WEIM market expert, and stakeholders that a tiered pricing structure that better links assistance energy transfer costs with the prevailing system conditions would be an improvement to the design. However, given our existing time constraints of trying to have something implemented prior to the summer of 2023, the proposal that we're putting forward is all that we think is achievable. We do plan to revisit the assistance energy transfer design and create a tiered approach. Whether that will be applied to this existing after the fact surcharge design or included in a more holistic redesign of the product is yet to be determined. Now, the revenue from assistance energy transfers we are proposing will be allocated pro rata to net EIM exporting balancing authorities. The idea behind the proposed revenue allocation is to incent and compensate WEIM balancing authorities that make surplus capacity available to the market during stress system conditions. 
available balancing capacity or its equivalent will be credited against the transfer surcharge amount. The available balancing capacity when credited in this manner provides a hedge to limit the exposure to spurious RSE failures and potential large asymmetric after the fact charges that could accrue during normal system conditions. Finally, consistent with the WEIM providing flexibility in its participation methods, the proposal allows each balancing authority area to elect whether to receive assistance energy transfers or remain under the status quo. Further, the cost suballocation for the assistance energy transfers will be at the discretion of each WEIM balancing authority. The proposal for the ISO BAA is to allocate the cost to demand and exports. Now, management proposes an enhancement that also ensures the resource efficiency evaluation only considers each balancing authority area's demand and firm export obligations. At the beginning of this phase, the ISO undertook significant data analysis to inform outstanding policy questions that were raised in the phase one development. One of the outcomes of this analysis was that ISO low priority exports were shown to often be supported by WEIN supply offers made into the real-time market. Including these lower priority exports in the ISO sufficiency obligation can and has led to inappropriate failures for the ISO balancing authority area. No changes are proposed to the current rules that allow other WEIM areas to count ISO low priority exports as supply in their resource sufficiency evaluation. We recognize that not proposing changes here does create an asymmetry. However, I plan to address that in more detail when we review the feedback we've received from stakeholders. The final change that management is proposing is to align the tagging rules with the quality of the different market products that can be purchased from the ISO's market. We believe that doing this will provide clarity to the receiving area of the quality of the interchange product they're purchasing. We view a firm provisional type designation applying to ISO low priority exports as being appropriate. This indicates that the energy will not be curtailed for economic reasons. However, for reliability reasons would receive lesser priority to ISO load. We also believe this clarification is consistent with existing tariff provisions that prioritize ISO BAA load over lower priority exports. Now, moving on to the feedback that we've received to this process. On assistance energy transfers, stakeholders broadly support the proposed ability to receive assistance energy transfers as an improvement to reliable operations. However, concerns were raised in this process. Select stakeholders express a concern that the proposed after the fact surcharge does not send the correct price signal to resource deficient balancing authorities. I think we largely agree with the sentiment. Uh, in the initial iterations of this process, we actually explored an in-market solution. However, what we found is that there was disagreements regarding what a right size price signal would be, as well as the current different participation methods within the WEIM not allowing for an equitable implementation. While we think there's a path forward here, we do not believe that these are issues we would be able to resolve and still meet our objective of a pre-summer 2023 implementation. Next, some stakeholders internal to the ISO balancing area did prefer more granular cost allocation. Uh, this again is a reasonable request. The reason we did not pursue it and pursue the proposed cost allocation is that it is consistent with other emergency type actions that are taken by system operators within the ISO BAA. Uh, to the extent that there is a desire for a more granular cost allocation for these type of actions, we think that they should be reviewed more holistically uh, in a future initiative. Now, stakeholders also broadly support the changes to the low priority export counting and tagging rules. Most stakeholders agree with the ISO changes not to count lower priority exports in the ISO balancing authority area's obligation for the resource sufficiency evaluation. Some stakeholders did raise a concern with allowing WEIM balancing authority areas to count ISO low priority exports as supply, which is what I noted earlier. Again, we agree this creates an asymmetry we believe at this time that living with this asymmetry is the best option uh, since this asymmetry really is limited to the RSE rather than reliability. 
the fact that the market cleared these low priority exports in the first place indicates that absent transfer limitations from failing the RFC or other significant changes to system conditions, we would expect there to be capacity to facilitate these energy transactions. We did explore through this process resolving this asymmetry. However, the stakeholder feedback is that it would be difficult for WEIM BAAs to accommodate this given the timing challenges relating to their base scheduling within the real-time market. We're currently exploring the feasibility of resolving these in working groups that the ISO partners with WEIM participates on. Next, stakeholders recognize the benefits of aligning the tagging rules with associated lower priority exports. Some stakeholders have raised concerns how this impacts their existing operational practices. We are sympathetic to the operational challenges this presents. We've reached out to and are in the process of working with our neighbors to determine how we may best be able to help and coordinate with this transition. While ultimately this may require some type of process changes, we believe that these are warranted as it does align the tag or information within the tag with the actual quality of the product that is being purchased out of the ISO's market. I also want to reiterate, uh, it's not in the slides, that the ISO system operators utilizing their judgment under good utility practice can curtail lower priority exports when necessary. The ISO systems are set up to limit the need to curtail these exports, especially limit manual curtailment prior to likely an EEA3. However, the ability to facilitate this curtailment does exist at any time per the ISO system operator's judgment. Further, the tagging changes I just discussed, we believe will allow the ISO system operators to more efficiently and effectively curtail low priority exports when, the, when through their judgment they deem necessary. So management recommends the Board of Governors and the WEIM governing body approve the proposed enhancements. Management recommends the WEIM governing body and the ISO Board of Governors through their joint approval authority, approve the elements relating to the proposal for assistance energy transfers, which we believe leverages the WEIM to increase reliability for balancing authority areas experiencing energy or flexibility deficiencies, as well as the proposal to exclude low priority exports from the ISO's resource efficiency evaluation obligation. Management also recommends the WEIM governing body support and the ISO governing body approve the proposed tagging rule enhancements that better reflect the attributes of lower priority exports from the ISO. Thank, thank you, Danny. Um, next up, we have the Department of Market Monitoring comments by uh, Ryan Kurlinski. Senior Manager of um, Market Policy and Analysis, formerly known as DMM. Ryan? Um, no, uh, actually, Roger, this is Eric Kildebrand. I'll be giving uh, DMM's comments today. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, the Department of Market Monitoring uh, supports uh, all of the, the enhancements being proposed. Um, I think in each case, there are um, well, there are requirements that can be made to them. Uh, they all are changes that the ISO was able to get pretty good agreement on and that can be implemented by next summer. Uh, beginning with the, the low priority exports, um, that one I think is, is pretty widely supported uh, and, and is a clear improvement and just kind of a the latest in ongoing or a series of improvements that has been made to the test in terms of counting more accurately and appropriately the different resources. Uh, turning then to the energy assistance proposal, um, this iteration, the final iteration we think um, is a significant step forward. Um, there were some concerns with earlier iterations that they may have been almost um, excessively uh, Unitive or, or costly uh, for participants to participate in. Um, the newer proposal, we think, um, while uh, the penalty itself is not scaled to system conditions in terms of the price, um, we did do some analysis, backcasting, and um, because the quantity that's subject to the test is scaled and limited, um, we think it does represent. Um, 
you know, a significant improvement with, you know, limited uh, risk of high costs when, when those would not have been warranted by the degree to which an, an area was either short on capacity or relying on the system. Um, so we think it's a big improvement. And again, while uh, there's general agreement that it can be improved in the future, we think it makes sense to move forward with net next summer. And we think, um, you know, that it should be attractive enough to hopefully get significant participation. Uh, and finally, we, we agree, you know, the other area of uh, future uh, development is, you know, of course, this is optional. Ideally, we would like to see um, kind of the consequences of, of failing the test for those that don't opt in, um, kind of the universal consequences. We think those should be re-examined as well in the next phase. Uh, so with that, we support all the different elements being proposed. Okay, any questions? Sorry. Eric, what is the, this is Ash, what is the um, surcharge? Uh, it would be a thousand dollars when that is the penalty price, or two thousand dollars should we be in a two thousand dollar penalty price situation. Okay, thanks. And but it's only under the last iteration. It's only applied to the amount uh, by which an area failed the test, um, or uh, the amount by which they were importing from the EIM. And I think what our analysis shows that, that cut out can, can be uh, quite limited in some cases. So if an area fails it by a relatively small amount, uh, it may, you know, the penalty would be rather small because the megawatts involved could be small. And in some cases, failures occur when an area was even importing power or exporting rather. So, you know, there would not be a penalty in that case either. Okay, thanks. Okay, if there's no more questions for Eric, our next uh, speaker would be Market Surveillance Committee, and I believe we have Ben Hobbs, our MSC chair. Is it Jim Bushnell today? Uh, it's Jim Bushnell. Ben will be presenting the energy storage enhancements part. Uh, can you hear me okay? Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, Okay, so uh, you've already heard the the details. I'll try to hit a couple high level points. You know, starting with the reminding people why we have a resource efficiency evaluation. Um, and I do think that the motivation has kind of evolved over time. Uh, but the original idea was to try to make uh, BAs who join the EIM comfortable that uh, they would not have uh, their scarcity conditions in a neighboring BA spill over into their BA as a consequence of participating in the EIM in an unwanted way. Um, and the key there is unwanted. Uh, anytime there's scarcity in a neighboring balancing authority, uh, it's probably gonna raise prices no matter what the market platform we're talking about would be. And so the, the key here is whether there are some unwanted uh, consequences as a result of participating in EIM. And uh, thinking, of the, or thinking through the earlier presentations, really the, the early kind of focus of the RSE was on the consequences to the exporting BA. Uh, and here we've sort of been talking about the importing BA, which uh, I think was less uh, internalized when the original policies were developed. Um, and so it's all about trying to prevent some kind of uh, scarcity spillover. Um, but it's an important point that Eric kind of hinted at is that most of the RSE failures that happen actually happen during periods when prices are relatively low and there isn't much of an indication of scarcity, at least regional level scarcities. It's some kind of local issue or a technical issue or even just a measurement issue. Um, and part of the concerns have been that we, we sort of have this focus on scarcity conditions and in fact, we're applying these uh, penalties and other consequences uh, during a lot of other periods that has some efficiency and other uh, concerns. Um, okay, so the other uh, aspect I want to highlight here, I was going to focus on the energy assistance proposal, which as was discussed, has kind of evolved through two or three different um, iterations. 
And uh, the way I think about this discussion is there's really a high level choice between whether we want to have a physical penalty for RSE failure that would in some yeah. way limit the amount that a failing BA can import as a consequence of its failure. Or do we want to have a financial paradigm where the dispatch in real time actually is not affected by the failure conditions, but instead we're using a financial penalty as a deterrent, if you will, to try to um, encourage all the BAs to stay compliant with the RSC requirements. Um, and you know the the current paradigm is a physical one. It caps imports into failing BAs. Uh, and as has been discussed, this raises concerns that if there is ample capacity outside those BAs, um, it can create reliability, unnecessarily create reliability issues by, by limiting the amount of imports those BAs can bring in physically. Um, there was an interim proposal that would have tried to incorporate the penalty into the actual dispatch decisions. That's also a physical sort of paradigm. It would have affected the dispatch in real time as a consequence of failure. Um, and it would have had other effects on energy prices that, that various stakeholders were uncomfortable with. So we ended up with this ex post financial penalty, but it is also a paradigm shift. It's one that's sort of uh, taking the financial uh, incentives as the, as the main uh, deterrent to um, failing an RSC test. Uh, and it does raise questions about what the right level of penalty would be to provide that kind of deterrence. Um, really, the levels of penalties that we've had were designed as uh, parameters for something that would be incorporated into the dispatch decisions. And, and you know, this kind of this last iteration came together rather quickly. And so it, it is a, a question about what the right deterrent uh, penalty level should be. I should add that financial penalties for violations like this are not unheard of. It's what NERC does for uh, violations of various uh, reliability uh, criterion, um, because they really don't have many other options for sanctions as well. So I do think it would be helpful for the EIM community to have a discussion about this high level paradigm question. Do we want to have a financial focused penalty or do we want to have something that uh, limits the actual physical dispatch in real time as a consequence? Um, there are a couple other finer points that we mentioned in the opinion that have been mentioned already. There's a big problem with the fact that the penalty is $1,000 per megawatt hour all the time. And as I've mentioned, most of the failures happen when we don't really have scarcity conditions and we have an ex post penalty like this. There's a risk that an entity could be dispatched imports because uh, the market thinks it'll save them $5 a megawatt hour when in fact they're paying a $1,000 per megawatt hour penalty instead. Um, and so there is a bit of a risk for importers during those periods. Um, as has been mentioned, there are a couple uh, aspects of the proposal that limit the quantity of megawatts that would be exposed to that penalty. Um, but as far as uh, the data I've seen, the magnitude of the failures is not very tightly correlated to the scarcity conditions either. So um, we could certainly do better by trying to size that penalty to market conditions, as has already been said by a couple speakers. Um, one other point we make is that uh, given that it's going to be an ex post penalty, there's the opportunity to try to measure more precisely exactly the magnitude of the failures, um, correct other measurement issues that have come up uh, periodically when we review the results of, of heat waves and so forth. And, and so it would be good to take advantage of that. Um, yeah, so to summarize, we support this proposal. It is a step forward. Um, because of the exposure to import penalty costs during off peak periods, I suspect most balancing authorities are going to opt out of this anyways, except during periods when they really expect scarcity conditions and they, they may need these uh, energy assistance options. Um, and that we really do need to try to calibrate these penalties better and decide, you know, as a community, whether we want a financial sort of focused uh, set of sanctions for this type of evaluation. Thanks. Happy to answer questions. Roger, you're on mute. I have a question. Um, Jim? I have a oh, Thank you. Go ahead. That just raised a question for me. This mm -hmm. option of opting in or out of the receiving transfers, is that something that's done like upfront permanently or is it, can you go back and forth? Uh, so my understanding, I don't know if it was revised, but previously it was going to be part of the master file. 
Um, and that would be a five to seven business day lag. And so I think of it roughly as a weekly decision. Um, Danny's on my video screen, so I'm not sure if yeah. he, maybe he can nod that's if that's right. that still the case. Yeah. So it's it's not hourly, um, like some stakeholders actually requested, but it's not a you know one-time choice either. Okay. Thanks. Okay, well, at this point in the schedule that we have for the uh, comments from the the board or the WEAM governing body generally on the proposal. And let me just set out, we have a little bit of a, a different structure here than normal because this um, initiative has two parts, has the RSC, RSE and the ETAG rules that we actually have three motions because the governing body uh, will vote on it whether or not to advise the board to uh, approve or, or otherwise. And um, since we started joint authority, we've actually only had one other joint meeting where we have done this. So, so ultimately, I want to give an opportunity for discussion from the board and the governing body, um, and then we will seek public comment on the initiative. And then you'll you'll see we'll be going to three separate motions. And when I get to the advisory role motion, I will give the governing body an opportunity to discuss that uh, in open session here as to their um, inclination on that. Um, so, with that. Um, let me, that long intro, let me go ahead and see if there are any comments from the, the board or the governing body on the initiative for any of the presenters or otherwise. Roger, this is John Prescott. Hi, John. Go ahead, please. Hi. Uh, we just want to thank all the participants and staff for working on this project. I, I think I read as I went through the, the detailed information that there was a uh, going to be a follow-on phase to look at some of these issues brought up. Can uh, can maybe that's a question for Danny to talk about what's expected in that follow-up phase. Yeah, thanks, John. Or yes, thanks. Uh, so I think that some of the questions that Jim raised about what is the actual intent will be will be up for open discussion. We also kind of explored potentially trying to provide assistance for balancing authority areas in surplus conditions. And then I think the other thing that we would look to address is the current status quo for failure, which would be the physical consequences. A lot of stakeholders have pointed out that those physical consequences of limiting transfers above zero is inequitable. So I think we would look to uh, have a new proposal that gets rid of those physical consequences or at least uh, applies them more equitably. Oh, okay, thanks. And I am assuming that that'll be a kind of a direct follow on. In other words, it's going to, you'll start work on that right away. I would defer to Anna there. I know in our roadmap, it's scheduled for 2023. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And that is in, in terms of our next steps on many of these initiatives, we are looking at all our stakeholder efforts as well as market design changes and upcoming in the future. We have a lot of things in line and uh, sort of needing to think about both the prioritization as well as the sequencing. We'll be announcing our roadmap earlier next year. We actually held that back this year for purposes of giving us a little bit more time uh, to consider stakeholder input as well as our own uh, consideration of these items. So we don't have a, a fixed schedule yet for our next steps, but that is something we'll be looking to provide. Thank you. Thanks for your question, Governing Body Member Prescott. Thank you, uh, John. So next on the, I see in the hand raise is Jennifer Gardner. Jennifer? Yeah, thanks, Roger. Um, before I start talking, I just want to make sure, is now an appropriate time to provide comments on the proposal? I realize we're not quite at the point where we're making a decision, but is, is now the appropriate time for a comment? I, yes. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, yeah, I just want to, you know, just briefly note that I, I really appreciated the um, the letter, the public comment that we received from NV Energy. Um, I know that NV Energy had been fairly vocal in earlier iterations of, of this initiative um, and expressing their concerns around challenges in procuring energy during emergencies that exist in the West um, due to a number of conditions, um, including severe weather events. 
And they noted in their public comment letter that um, the ability to procure this kind of emergency energy has really declined noticeably over time as we've seen more and more entities join the EIM. And so while we're seeing EIM benefits increase, we're also seeing abilities to procure emergency energy through the bilateral market decrease. And so I just want to underscore that point. I think it's an excellent point and, and a huge reason for why we're here today discussing some of these enhancements. And so, again, I want to acknowledge that NV Energy did support um, this phase two and acknowledge that obviously a subsequent phase would be necessary to continue addressing some of these needs, but that in the interest of grid reliability, the current proposal was, um, was sufficient. And so just in terms of as we prepare to embark on phase three of this initiative, I also want to highlight something that the governing body heard from our market expert, Susan Pope, yesterday during the governing body's general session. And I agree with this recommendation and want to make sure that, you know, it is heard by, by both audiences. So during phase three of this initiative, Kaiso, sh Kaiso should undertake an additional effort in exploring the development of a tiered ex ante penalty that would be included in the dispatch. So again, this is transitioning to a tiered approach that would be based on forecasts that would take place um, as an in-market solution rather than after the fact. Um, to enhance accuracy, to enhance market efficiencies. Um, Susan iterated a number of benefits of, of transitioning towards that type of approach. And I wanna just you know, underscore that I support that recommendation and think we should focus on that um, as a part of the phase three initiative. So thank you for the time. Thank you, Jennifer. Andy Campbell, you have uh, your hand yep, up. Thanks. Thanks, Roger. Uh, yeah, also a, a comment. You know, I, you know, I support reforming the resource efficiency failure consequences, and I'm going to support this proposal. Uh, you know, it's important for the sustainability of the market that the RSE requires EIM entities to plan and make advanced plans for to meet their low ob obligations throughout the year. But I also do believe there's opportunities for the EIM to play a larger role uh, to help one area that may be in a shortage or stressed conditions be supported by areas with excess supply. Um, you know, input from MSC, the governing body market expert stakeholders have pointed toward further reform, which I certainly support going further. You know, particularly supportive of the idea of getting to an endpoint that's not opt in, opt out. I think that that sort of framework can potentially set up some challenges. Um, and you know, I also just want to note this could be in place for three years. So during that period, I would hope uh, I would like to see the DMM and ISO staff, uh, you know, monitor. What's going on as they as they do in normal practice? Share analysis about participation and impact, and also um, want to also amplify another comment from the governing body market expert, which uh, she spent some time thinking about the sequencing of this and a few other ongoing uh, initiatives. She focused on the interplay between the RSC and load conformance practices, which is uh, you know is getting attention, and, and I certainly think should continue to get attention. Uh, so I'd encourage the you know, staff to take a look at the, the next steps that she she lays out. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Anita? So I, much of what I'm going to say has been said, but I just want to underscore because it it's been something that certainly has been um, on everyone's mind. And I really do want to acknowledge the work that's been done by stakeholders and staff. There's so much going on, but people have really dedicated a lot of time to this particular issue. So I'm still concerned about have we made substantive progress? And I understand that there's a we've got to get ready for summer. But, um, and by and large, I'm supportive of the changes uh, in terms of the priority exports and the energy assistance. They are a step forward, and they, but they do recognize a number of compromises to a more robust approach, which leaves some work still on the table, I think has been, has been, has been said by both Jennifer and by Andy, um, and I suspect Rob may say the same thing, and it's what John also alluded to. Most specifically, as noted by the MSC, the DMM, and the governing body market expert, is the surcharge, um, otherwise known as the penalty. We keep interchanging whether it's penalty or surcharge, but that needs additional work. And it needs to be work that's done to encourage people to be in instead of doing this opt in and opt out. I support the proposal with reservations um, in regard to the timing to make further improvements that address some of the stakeholders' concerns sooner than later. Thank you, Anita. Uh, Chair Konzioka. Thank you, Roger. So uh, Anita's correct that uh, 
some of my comments uh, have been covered. And um, I, I would like to, to note that as Anita did, that this um, issue on resource efficiency has a, a, a long history now. Um, something that seems relatively simple, uh, philosophically, resource efficiency evaluation has proven to be quite vexing to come to uh, outcomes that are, are supported. And uh, we have been challenged in coming up with these consequences. Um, I, I think that the, the references to uh, the letter we received from NV Energy is, is very pertinent. Um, and noting that initially when we started down this path, it was to be something that would be implemented for summer of 2022, in other words, last summer. And so I think in our decision-making, um, it rightfully points out where, you know, what should we be doing in making a decision so that we do have something for summer 2023 and to be in better position than we were last summer. And I think that certainly plays into uh, how I perceive in weighting this in total. Um, it has been covered um, the, by, by everybody else on a governing body that the phase three um, work, which was assumed to come out of this re regardless of where we end up, um, certainly is highlighted pretty much in every uh, stakeholder's comment. So when, when you look at, at what was said, um, support with caveats and all the caveats are how do we move this forward in, in, this, in this next phase and, and I support that and I think that that Anita and Andy and John and Jennifer highlighted um, those those elements and and so I don't think I need to wade into into that and then uh, lastly um, repeating a little bit differently uh, from what uh, I heard yesterday from um, the governing body market expert and, and as a reminder this was our first presentation by the market expert and I, you know, the Board of Governors does have the written material, um, but she was asked uh, by uh, member Prescott, um, okay, so in totality, when you look at all these issues that are on the table, um, are we better off um, with the proposed changes um, or waiting till we refine it more? And had a clear response that, that yes, in her opinion, her perspective is we are much better off implementing the, the proposal as it is, and then working out all the other issues in a phase three approach. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Governor Borenstein, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, I, I did want to follow up on something Rob said that the Board of Governors has the material from the market expert um because i i don't see that in our briefing book but uh i i may have missed it i would like to see it um, um just just so you know um severin if it's not in your your board book then um i just you know i tried to make certain that happened it did get posted last week and and just you know i thought when i made my comments that you did have access to okay. it so if you didn't it's my like a public website but um yeah in the future it'd be great to make sure it gets into our readings um i i'm going to support this i recognize that it does not solve all problems uh i do think that we need to continue to balance uh these concerns with leaning uh with at the same time uh, op allowing markets to do what they're good at and create gains from trade. And as we move into talking about EDAM, uh, I think I want to push back on the idea that that balance is the same in a day ahead market. It seems to me it is very, very different. And I hope that we can uh, start from a sort of different starting point. Uh, and frankly, I'm not sure resource efficiency evaluation for a day ahead market uh, is the, the right paradigm. Thanks. Thank you, Governor Bornstein. Um, Anna McKenna, you have your hand up. I do, uh, but I, I'm not sure if we're done with comments. I'd be happy to wait. You, you are entitled to give them as well. So please go ahead. I did want to respond to a couple of the comments that were made with regards to requests for continued uh, evaluation 
and considerations for changes in the future in RSC. I just wanted to provide some feedback. Um, I think a lot of the discussion we've had, including the discussion we had, had yesterday with the market expert, um, Susan Pope, you know, uh, she pointed to some good uh, information as well that we need to consider as we consider changes to the RSC. And I just wanted to also share that, you know, we have a lot of uh, interrelationship between the EDAM as well as the WEIM RSC um, that we're looking at closely as well. And part of the, F, as well as, uh, you know, our uh, other initiatives on, that are currently underway and will take in, in more full first force over the next year. And in particular, our scarcity pricing initiative in the price formation effort, which all come into play as to what does it mean to actually transfer from the WEIM RSE. And I think it's really critical that we look at our next steps in the context of all these changes as we sequence them and get ready for our next, our next uh, iteration of the WEIM RSE. Um, I think it's also really important to consider that for next summer, uh, these, the opt out and opt in nature of this does really, uh, you know, we, you know, we do recognize there's a, not as good as it, we'd like to have it, uh, but it is it, it, to some degree that opt out and opt in nature of the, the test was provided because of the lack of tiers we were able to incorporate into the test. So that mitigates a little bit some of the issues that were uh, raised because during situations when there isn't extreme conditions or you know things are not so bad, entities can opt out and not be subject to the costs. Whereas when things are really bad, then the tiers become less relevant and the test is the, the uh, option is there for, for market participants, I'm sorry, for EIM entities to be able to access those transfers. Um, so just wanted to make a couple of those notes and wanted to provide the assurance that as we consider our next steps, both for an in-market ex ante type of approach, perhaps to uh, consequences of failure, looking at scarcity pricing more closely as to how that impacts the consequences of fail failures as well. And also the interaction with the EDAM design, that is something we will be taking all into consideration as we consider when and how we move into the next phase of um, this test. Thank you, Anna. Seeing no more hands raised, um, I will go ahead now and ask the operator to open it up for public comment. Operator? If you would like to make a public comment, you can place yourself in the queue by pressing the raise hand icon on Zoom located at the bottom of your screen. If you are dialed in to our phone only line, you can dial pound two on your telephone keypad to enter the queue. There's no one in the queue for public comment at this time. Okay, thank you, operator. Um, if I will uh, give one last chance to the executive team, board of governors, governing body before we go ahead and start the voting. Any other comments, questions, um, or anything else? Okay, well, as I noted before, we have three motions that we are going to address here. And so I'm gonna start with the uh, RSE changes, and that's moved that the ISO Board of Governors and the WEIM governing body approve the two changes to the resource sufficiency evaluation proposal as described in the memorandum dated December 7, 2022, and moved that the ISO Board of Governors and the WEIM governing body authorize management to make all necessary and appropriate filings with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to implement these changes, including any filings that implement the overarching initiative policy, but contain discrete revisions to incorporate commission guidance in any initial ruling on the proposed tariff amendment. Can I have a motion, please? I'll move, Tosh. I'll second. Tosh and Angelina, thank you. And um, Chair Bagua, your vote? Aye. Governor Borenstein? Aye. Member Campbell? Aye.
Member Decker. So I've stated my reservation, but I. Thank you. Governor Galitova. Aye. Vice Chair Gardner. Aye. Chair Konzioka. Thank you. Rob, you're on mute. My apologies. I can you hear me. I Vice Chair Leslie. Yes, we have you. Vice Chair Leslie. Aye. Member Prescott. Aye. And Governor Shorey. Aye. Thank you, governors and uh, governing body members. The, the motion does pass. And um, so at this time, and I appreciate your, your patience on the process on this. It's a little bit more lengthy um, in the, this regard, a little bit different than what we normally do. So at this point, the, on the ETAG portion of the discussion today, the governing body has an opportunity to vote on an advisory role. And so before I ask for that vote and assume what you uh, want me to do to kind of fill in the blanks, um, let me ask if you know Rob or anyone else from the governing body would like to um, kind of lead the discussion on that for the governing body members as to how they would like to vote. Uh, thank you, Roger. Um, what I would ask of the um, First, of the governing body, if there is any um, additional comment or discussion they would like to have. Okay, um, not, I'm double checking, uh, I'm not seeing any. Uh, so with that, I will suggest, uh, I, I would ask one of the governing body members to make a motion in support of uh, making advisory, so. Um, yeah, and, and the particular question at issue, is um, whether you want to support management's proposal pertaining to the ETAG rules or or not support. And um, so, you know, if you can kind of give me the guidance on that, then I'll read the motion and we'll go through okay. the process. So th this is John. Uh, so can, can one of the governing body members make an initial uh, request on the motion? Yeah, th this is John. I'd make the motion to support. Thank you, John. Just need a second. Thank you. So I will go ahead and read it now and we'll go through the formal process. And, um, and maybe I'll think about a way to make this smoother next time. But move that the WEIM governing body advises the ISO Board of Governors as discussed in the December 14, 2022 Joint General Session meeting that it supports management's proposal pertaining to ETAG rules for low priority export, exports as described in the memorandum dated December 7, 2022. I have a motion on that from the governing body. I thought John moved that. Yeah, we'll just go through. Roger, John makes that motion and Anita seconds that. Okay, sorry to be so wooden on that. I appreciate that. Oh, yeah, that's, and <laughs> that's okay. It's, we've done yeah. this once almost a year ago. And, um, and let me go ahead alphabetically and take your vote. Member Campbell? Aye. Decker? Aye. Vice Chair Gardner? Aye. Chair Konzioka? Aye. And Member Prescott? Aye. Thank you, governing body. The, the motion has been recorded as passed to uh, advise the governing body or advise the board to support the ETAG rule changes. And with that, I will now ask for a motion from the board. Move that the ISO Board of Governors approve the ETAG rules for low priority exports as described in the memorandum dated December 7, 2022, and move that the ISO Board of Governors authorizes management to make all necessary and appropriate filings with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to implement these changes, including any filings that implement the overarching initiative policy, but contain discrete revisions to incorporate commission guidance in any initial ruling on the proposed tariff amendment. Can I have a motion, please, from the Board of Governors? So moved. Second. Thank you. 
Thank you, Angelina and uh, Severin, you get the second. Governor Bogwat, your vote. Aye. Governor Borenstein. Aye. Governor Galitova. Aye. Governor Leslie. Aye. And Governor Shorey. Aye. Thank you, governors. That again, that motion passes. And and at the beginning of the meeting, I missed the second part of agenda item number one, which was public comment for general public comment. And so before we go to the next item, um, I want to do two things. One is I want to have the operator uh, seek general public comment if there is any public comment for items that are not on today's agenda. Again, I apologize. That should have been done at the beginning. Operator, can you do that, like please? To make a general Absolutely. If you would like to make a general public comment, you may place yourself in the queue by pressing the raise hand icon on Zoom located at the bottom of your screen. If you're dialed into the phone only line, you may dial pound two to enter the public comment queue. There is no one in the queue for public comment at this time. Excellent, thank you. And again, my apologies for the uh, out of order on that. Uh, before we go to agenda item number four, I would like to ask if the, the governing body and the board would like to take a five minute break. I was, it was requested earlier that um, we build in some breaks given the amount of activity in today's meeting. I think five um, minutes makes sense. So. Yeah. Okay. Good idea. All right. So, so let's everybody stay put. We're going to put ourselves on hold for five minutes and we will be back at um, no later than 3.09. I'm going to give seven minutes for that. Yeah, 309. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we are going to continue with our meeting. And we next is agenda item number four. And I would like to note for the record that we did receive two comment letters, one from the Large Scale Solar Association and one from Vistra Corporation. And those letters have been provided to the board as well as to the governing body. And to introduce our topic is Anna McKenna, our Vice President of Market Policy and Performance. Anna? Thank you, Roger. Um, and uh, welcome back from our break, everyone. Um, I, again, have the pleasure to introduce Gabe Murtog to present to you our proposed changes in the storage uh, for energy storage enhancements today. I wanted to take a, a moment also today to, to thank the entire stakeholder community and our uh, staff and with Gabe's leadership on this, these proposed changes. You know, over the past couple of years, as we've been seeing more and more storage resources coming on, we have taken a number of uh, efforts to really uh, look closely as to how best to integrate, manage uh, storage resources reliably through our markets and in our systems, both reliably and efficiently. Um, through, the, through the markets. And these changes today come to you in the spirit of, uh, and continuing to do so. Uh, you know, we are definitely expecting more energy resources, storage resources to come in on the system in the future, and we'll be continuing to look at enhancements in the future. But after a, a long stakeholder initiative with a lot of participation, we were able to come up with a, a couple of solutions that will help us uh, better, more reliably manage storage resources. And we do hope to continue this dialogue with stakeholders in the future as we see them performing, as we see how they perform in the market and have an opportunity to evaluate um, more and more these, the, their, their, their participation in the market and what the consequences of the market world changes we make are. So with that, I will turn this over to Gabe Murtaugh, who's going to present to you today our proposal for uh, the energy storage enhancements for this year. Thank you, Anna. I appreciate the introduction. And um, I regret to say that uh, we didn't coordinate on introductory remarks because I have, have a few as well. Um, first of all, uh, good afternoon. And, and I would just formally like to thank the WEIM governing body and the ISO Board of Governors for the opportunity to speak today 
on the energy storage enhancement policy. I think this is incredibly important policy and, and work that the ISO is doing. Uh, before I begin, though, I would like to say, and, and Anna just noted this, but storage impacts nearly all the functions that we do here at the ISO. And the team working behind the scenes on storage policy is incredibly large. It covers the entire scope of the organization. And you know, the, the core team that we're working with includes more than 60 individuals across the com company. And that doesn't include you know, things like management oversight and feedback that we get uh, from stakeholders and things like that. So these are the individuals that are ensuring that the ISO core functions are protected while we are accommodating tremendous amounts of new storage resources coming onto the grid, and we are allowing new market modeling and new features uh, to be offered to storage resources, including the ones that are in, in this policy. This team, I think, represents some of the smartest people across the company, and they have contributed a significant amount of time and a lot of hard work to develop storage policy over the last two years. Um, I am incredibly indebted to this team, and it is an honor um, to be able to represent their hard work today and present this policy to you. So I, I just wanted to note that I'm very appreciative for them. Um, I would begin with a little bit of background on the storage landscape. So two years ago, there was really very little storage on the ISO grid, and, and for that matter, really there was very little storage across the country. And when I'm thinking about storage, I'm not really uh, considering legacy storage resources like some of the pumped hydro facilities that we do have on our system. Thinking about um, you know, a lot of the, the storage capacity that's come online uh, over the last few years. Um, this new storage capacity is predominantly four hour duration lithium ion batteries. And today the ISO operations team has access to nearly 5,000 megawatts of this capacity. So it, it, it's very large, and this is the largest amount of battery capacity online in any grid in North America and likely anywhere around the world. These resources can and do serve a significant portion of load during the most critical times of the day, and they also provide large portions of ancillary services needed to ensure grid uh, operations and reliable grid operations. These resources do not have concepts of startups, startup times, or minimum loads or time to move from minimum loads. They're incredibly fast ramping and they're incredibly responsive to ISO market instructions. The very rapid growth in storage capacity is not over and the ISO and the state of California anticipate that we will have a total of 10,000 megawatts or an additional 5,000 megawatts of capacity on the system going into the summer of 2024 for new storage capacity. And this continued rapid build out of storage doesn't just stop after 2024. It's gonna continue as the state advances towards reduced greenhouse gas emission targets. Um, California is certainly not the only place where we're seeing rapid storage deployment. Today, uh, there is some storage resources that are participating in the Western Energy Imbalance Market or the WEIM. Uh, but there's not a huge amount of storage uh, that's out there participating in this market today. But I'm in conversations with many developers and many balancing authority areas across the West, and it's clear that there will be significant amounts of storage developed across the West, and those storage resources will likely be uh, participating in the WEIM markets over the next few years. So with that said, the changes that we're discussing today within this policy are very relevant um, to both the current and future market participants within the California Balancing Authority area, but also those that are going to be in the WEIM market and the future extended day ahead market. So a final note is that most of the storage policy and the market tools that we've developed and we have and are, we're using on the system today were implemented at a time before we had very much storage capacity actually operating and performing on the system. So this policy really is the ISO looking back on performance of these resources over the last few years and thinking about where we need to go and how we need to evolve the, the policies and the tools that we already have on our market 
um, so that we could continue to advance and accommodate storage resources. As Anna said, this is certainly not the last chapter in the story. And as we learn even more from continued growth and more storage participation, we will have additional things and additional improvements on the modeling. So today, as a part of the policy, we're going to be discussing um, three aspects of the policy that have to do with reliability. Um, the first two aspects are specific to storage resources that are providing ancillary services. And this, this, uh, these two items of the policy directly come from feedback that we've heard from our operations team where there have been some challenges uh, for storage resources that, are, that we're relying on to provide uh, regulating services and ancillary services in general. The third item, and this is also related to reliability, has to do with exceptional dispatch for storage resources. This is important, and this is something that um, we, we could potentially have used uh, over the summer during the heat wave events, and we anticipate that this is going to help enable our operations team to more effectively manage storage resources in the future. Um, there are two new changes to our co-located model. Um, so this is the model that we use when uh, storage is located at the same location as potentially a renewable resource. The most common combination is solar and storage. Um, we are you know, thinking about tools and proposing a tool to prevent grid charging, and we're also extending these co-located features to pseudo-tie resources. The final change, and this one is, is fairly minor um, in terms of what needs to be done to implement it. Maybe it's a little bit more um, challenging when you think about it conceptually, but, it, but it's a very small change or update to the default energy bid for the storage resources in the day ahead market. So just to get into a little bit of detail on um, what we're proposing here on the first three proposals. Um, the first two, as I mentioned, have to do with ancillary services and storage resources being able to provide those ancillary services. Today, our market mechanisms aren't as sophisticated as they could potentially be. Um, for example, when we are calculating or estimating what state of charge is for storage resources, we bake in energy schedules for those resources. So there could be schedules for the resource to charge or schedules for the resource to discharge. And we internalize those and we understand, or our markets understand, that those energy schedules will impact the amount of state of charge that a resource has. So if you, you know, charge the resource for an hour during the middle part of the day, it'll have additional energy that it can discharge later in the day um, and allow for discharge schedules. Um, what our markets don't do today is to model impacts on state of charge from regulation awards. Um, today, we actually see storage resources receive um, schedules for multiple hours to provide regulation. For example, you might get an award for regulation up hour after hour after hour during a particular day. Um, as that resource is actually providing that regulation up service, it will certainly deplete the state of charge of that resource, but today that's not modeled. So our first proposal is to include um, both regulation up and regulation down and ISO estimated impacts on state of charge in how state of charge is going to be modeled for those resources. The second proposal is to require bids in the opposite direction alongside ancillary service awards. And this proposal is really there to ensure that the market can charge storage resources and it will help ensure that these resources are available to provide ancillary services in the real-time market. And again, this is, you know, the reason that the ISO is proposing this stems directly from operational experience that we've got from resources potentially not being able to provide these services in the real-time market today. It doesn't happen all the time, uh, but there have been cases that have been documented where this occurs. So um, we, we do think that both of these changes are necessary. Um, we think that the first one is going to help better align schedules in the day ahead in the real-time market. It doesn't completely obviate a potential that there you know, will be circumstances where a storage resource could be fully depleted and not able to provide a uh, regulating or other ancillary service in the real-time market. And that's why we really need to have um, bids in 
in the market that the ISO can access to be able to dispatch those resources to charge so we can get them um, sufficiently charged and um, have them uh, able to respond to um, regulating or other ancillary service uh, instructions that they're receiving from the ISO market. The third proposal is to improve um, efficiency and accuracy for issuing exceptional dispatch instructions to storage resources. Today, the ISO has the ability to instruct any resource to move to a particular megawatt target. Um, so if I want to get 100 megawatts out of a, a particular resource on the grid, I can issue that as an exceptional dispatch. Um, what the ISO doesn't have the authority to do or the ability to do is to uh, tell a storage resource to move up to a particular state of charge and hold that state of charge for a, for a period of time. That may be necessary on peak days when we know we have some real challenges coming later in the evening and those challenges are outside of the optimization window of the real-time markets. Um, this, the, uh, these new tools that we're proposing will allow storage uh, operators in the ISO operations team to issue those kinds of instructions to storage resources. It all also offers some compensation for storage resources that are providing these services. Um, we have three additional um, functions that we're, that we're uh, considering here in this proposal. The first is additional functionality to ensure that storage resources receiving charging instructions are less than on-site renewable output. This helps storage resources resources maximize investment tax credits, and these investment tax credits could be critical for the storage resource to receive financing um, from lenders and eventually get built on the, on the system. Um, obviously, the ISO is supportive of bringing new uh, uh, resources onto the grid, particularly resources that are going to help us meet our greenhouse gas objectives, and we want to incentivize and help those resources um, as they're coming onto the grid. And this is one of the features that, again, we got direct feedback from stakeholders who said, you know, this would be really helpful in, you know, getting us onto the system and having us uh, participate as fully as possible, um, being within those parameters of um, those, those guidelines for financing. Uh, the fifth item of this policy is to enable pseudo tie resources to use co-located functionality. So these are specifically for uh, resources that are located outside of the California ISO balancing authority area. And um, these are resources that the ISO can give direct instructions to. Uh, but what we hadn't specifically al allowed for when we were developing the co-located model is for these pseudo tie resources to be able to use the same features that we allow for the co-located resources. So this explicitly does this. And again, this is something uh, that we got in terms of feedback from stakeholders who said, gee, I might have resources that would want to use this participation model. You know, we understand that need and that's why we're delivering this functionality to storage resources. Finally, and um, this may be one of the smaller uh, uh, changes that we're making, is making a update to the day ahead default energy bid which is used for market power mitigation that's applied to storage resources and expanding the formulation to include an opportunity cost parameter in that uh, day ahead default energy bid. This is already something that we include in the default energy bid for real time resources. Um, it's also uh, you know, something that we discussed as a potential aspect in the ESDER 4 initiative when we first developed it, the default energy bid for storage resources. Um, and the reason we're addressing this here in this initiative is, again, because we've had actual operational experience where the formulation of the default energy bid had some unintended consequences, and we believe by making this change it's going uh, to eliminate those unintended consequences. So we think this is a good move going forward. Um, great. So there, I, I would say we've had a lot of stakeholder engagement on this policy. And for the most part, there have been fairly supportive uh, comments, but there have been some stakeholders who have expressed concerns about um, specific aspects, um, particularly around the proposals that we've got on the ancillary service measures that are included in this initiative. Um, 
Specifically, some of the stakeholders have expressed a, a um, ask to exclude the second proposal that we've got, the, the bidding requirements. And we, we've really thought about this. We've taken those um, proposals and, and those requests very seriously. Uh, but after carefully relying the way of the reliability concerns against other potential impacts from including these requirements, we feel that it's more beneficial to include this uh, new bidding requirement because it is going to help reliable operations, uh, which is really essential to what we do here at the ISO. Management remains committed, and I think Anna's already alluded to this a little bit, to assessing the efficacy of the programs and the tools that are implemented for reliability. Um, the proposed tools can be tuned over time, so we're going to specifically um, put some places in our business practice manuals uh, where we'll have parameters that we can actually change over time, and we will be reviewing uh, how these things are actually performing and working on, on in the market, and but you know potentially Im improving the equations that we're using going forward. And we will be reevaluating the need overall for some of these tools as we gain some operational experience with them in place. Uh, before we go to the decision for recommendation, I would like to um, note that, you know, and, and as Anna has already mentioned, we did receive a uh, comment in, in, in the form of a memorandum from Vista, Vista, Vistra Energy yesterday. And um, this comment was, a, these comments were addressed to the ISO Board of Governors and the WEIM governing body. Um, and the ISO management would like to thank Vistra for its continued engagement in the policy development process, and not just for policies related to storage, but a broad range of policy across multiple facets of markets overseen by the ISO. The ISO management also notes that Vistra has, is a very large storage resource operator in the footprint, and uh, we respect that the Vistra team has a unique insight into the market features that the ISO implements and how they impact storage resources. Um, with that said, in the Vistra memorandum, it requests that the ISO Board of Governors and the WEIM governing body take action to direct ISO staff on three items. First, uh, the, the, or the first item is to ensure severability when filing the aspects of the energy storage enhancements policy related to ancillary services from the remainder of the policy when filing at FERC. Second is to adjust market constraints, specifically the ancillary service data charge constraint, to ensure that adverse and potentially harmful outcomes are avoided in the market. The third is to address a variety of additional concerns for operating storage resources through future stakeholder processes. The ISO management formally responds to these requests here. So the response to the first request is that the ISO management does believe that each of the six aspects of the proposal within the energy storage enhancements policy is independent of each other. Um, to respond to the second uh, comment here in the memorandum is that Vistra notes that introducing additional constraints could lead to inefficient, potentially harmful, and or adverse outcomes. Um, first, ISO would note that any constraint enforced in the market necessarily leads to uh, less efficient outcomes by nature of the, the uh, market makeup, and if the constraint ever binds, uh, you know, th this is specific when the constraint binds, you get a less efficient outcome. However, we enforce constraints in the market to reflect operational reality of the electrical system and certain reliability needs for grid operation. The ISO management, again, feels strongly that the proposed constraints outlined by the energy storage enhancement policy are necessary and will help ensure sufficient ability for storage resources to provide ancillary services going forward. ISO management notes that introducing any new constraint or market element poses the risk of unforeseen outcomes. To guard against these outcomes, the ISO thoroughly vets any changes to the market prior to implementation. The proposed changes in this case have been vetted extensively by market analytics and market technology staff, and they do not anticipate unintended outcomes for these constraints. However, should these constraints have adverse interactions with or uh, you know, with, with themselves or with other existing constraints um, that result in gross inefficiencies, harmful or adverse outcomes, ISO management is com committed to reviewing these constraints and rapidly fixing them to avoid these outcomes. 
Uh, finally, to address uh, the, the final note, the ISO notes that a comprehensive and thoughtfully balanced roadmap for future initiatives, including the efforts to address market concerns for storage resources, including those noted by Vistra, will be published and discussed publicly in the first quarter of 2023. ISO management welcomes and respects comments and feedbacks from stakeholders and looks forward to working closely with Vistra and other storage operators and developers to address market issues facing storage in the future. Um, to go on to the next slide, um, management does recommend that the WEIM governing body and the ISO board approve the proposed energy storage enhancements. Um, we provide enhancements to ensure storage resources are available for reliable grid operations. We are being responsive to stakeholder concerns that co-located storage facilities need to protect investment tax credits. And again, this is directly based on feedback that we received from the storage community. And finally, we're aligning day ahead and real-time default energy bid formulations uh, for more reliable and, and robust solutions for storage resources participating in our markets. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, is there any comments or questions uh, before we go to the De Department of Market Monitoring? Yeah, I actually, this is Ash, I do have a, a question. So I, the, the six elements of this proposal, five of them I fully understand. What I don't understand fully is the second one, the requirement of a bid in the opposite direction of the, I mean, isn't one of, does it, basically it seems to me quite inefficient because it prevents storage from buying low and selling high which is kind of what it does. So why, I need a better explanation of why it's necessary for reliability purposes. So yeah, that, that's a good question, Ash. Um, so what we are actually seeing in the market is that storage resources are receiving multiple hours of schedules um, for a particular ancillary service. So say uh, regulation up. So hour after hour after hour, storage resources will get um, an award at their Pmax for regulation up. And eventually those resources will be fully depleted from, the, from energy and they won't be able to provide that service anymore. Today, there is no um, requirement that those resources bid in charging energy into the market just because they are providing ancillary services. Um, and, and, and this is actually what's happening. So what we are saying here is that we need some bids in the market be able to charge these resources, um, and this would be done through our market mechanism. So we'd still be doing it at the most efficient times, and we'd only be doing it when these storage resources that are providing ancillary services need to be charged in order to provide that service to the grid. So I guess I'm not seeing that last constraint. I mean, it, it, is the bid requirement not every hour? Um, the the are we thinking about bid requirements for resource adequacy resources or it, it, this bidding requirement that we're proposing here in the in the policy yeah. is only specific for resources that are providing ancillary services and it would only be specific for the hours where they are awarded the ancillary services right but that's going to be that could be true in a day in which we don't need the resource in the, in, i assume you're worried about needing the resource during the net peak right so, I, I mean, this, this would be general for any resource that's providing ancillary services. So, if I'm providing regulation up at, you know, 4 o'clock in the morning or if I'm providing regulation up at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, what we're saying is in the real-time markets, the ISO needs to have some ability through our energy markets to be able to charge those resources so they can continue to provide those services to the grid. And today, and today we don't have that. I may, I may be missing something. Someone else saying something? Yeah, can I just jump in? I, yeah, please, I please. think I have a different understanding, but now I want to make sure. My understanding was what this does is give the ISO a benchmark that has been submitted. It doesn't tell them what they're bidding. It says they are required to bid. Is that correct? Bid, bid energy, yes. Yeah. Yes. So it basically is telling, saying that there has to be a number in there that if we need to, we can charge you. And now we know what, what number you're putting in there. If you were to put an extreme number, depending on whether you're charging or discharging, I can't do it in my head right now, um, you can 
make it very costly or not uh, to uh, charge or discharge. Is that right? Yeah, it, 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 and the more important aspect is not what they're bidding, it's that they're bidding. So right. as long as we have the bids, we, we can issue a dispatch and get them charged up so we can have the service. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Um, Chair Konziolke, you have your hand up or is that a legacy? No, not a legacy. Thank you, Roger. Um, okay. Gabe, thank you for this presentation and this overview. I've got three questions. And, and again, you, you covered the areas that uh, I'd like to uh, ask a few questions about. And uh, so you got, got a hand. It's very similar to what Osh uh, was asking about. And um, when you were developing, or you and your staff were developing the, the bidding requirements, and, and I understand why you want to do this, um, did you have data that indicated that these actions weren't being taken? In other words, you, were, you, know, you, you, you have data from, let's say, this summer to where uh, there were ancillary services being bid, and then you did not see um, subsequent action being taken, um, bids being submitted to, to charge and, and, and offset the, the action being taken by the battery. Yeah, yeah, fr frankly, we did. Um, so we've had a lot of discussions with the operations team, and we've gone through internally specific examples and cases where, you know, storage resources have generator control instructions that they receive when they are awarded regulation. Um, so we've done deep dive root cause analysis analyses internally. Uh, we've also taken some initial time in this initiative to socialize, you know, at a high level, some of these findings with stakeholders, including running through specific examples. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I think there was one particular case where we had an operation engineer talk about a, a case where a storage resource really wasn't able to provide regulation and, you know, some of the data was masked to, um, you know, not call a particular resource out. Um, but we, we have had these discussions. We've also looked at, you know, very broad data on the storage fleet in general and looked at bidding patterns and, you know, state of charge, actual state of charge from storage resources on the grid and when they're able to perform and when they're not able to perform and we, we sound, found some correlations there as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I see Anna's there and, and this next question uh, or next two questions, either one of you might be, be answering it. Um, so you, you covered the points made by the Vistra letter and, and, and I'm glad they sent that in. Um, I thought it was very helpful in, in understanding the, the perspectives um, when they you know, look at the um, series of comments been, being made. Um, they, they generally support this proposal. Uh, they, they certainly have uh, concerns about the ancillary services. But on the first one, with respect to the, the FERC filing, and you noted that mm -hmm. the, the six separate components um, that will, can be submitted, um, is, is in the normal process, can FERC or will FERC approve um, uh, a package and maybe um, sever a portion of it so they can approve it in whole or, or approve it in part? I will yeah, definitely Chair, defer that question to Anna. Yeah, and, and thank you, Gabe. Uh, Chair Konzioka, I was going to respond to that. In fact, I raised my hand to try to provide <laughs> some additional context in that regard with that request. Um, you know, when we file at FERC, we do have the option to indicate to FERC that items that are often filed in one complete package that it's provided to the commission in one filing are in fact severable so the commission can decide on one item and not necessarily approve another item or treat another item differently. And uh, what VISTRA has requested effectively is that we do that with these items. Uh, we haven't completed our tariff process uh, yet on this item, but we are and we do anticipate that we will be filing these items as to be treated as independent. As to how they're actually uh, configured in the tariff, there may be some overlapping language. We need some flexibility there to make sure we have that right. But we view these items to be uh, 
uh, independent from each other and can be considered uh, in, a, in a separate context. Um, that said, they're all related because they are all related to providing more efficient and reliable uh, operations of storage resources, uh, but we do anticipate that they can be treated as independent from each other. The context of which how we submit that in the filing, we're still working on, um, but that's how we were uh, looking to respond to that question. Okay, thank you. And then my last question, um, I, Gabe, you touched on it in your comments, and I think and also in your response to, to Ash, um, on, on, on committing to this uh, additional work, um, you know, Vistra is, is asking, you know, um, fairly strong language, but, but uh, what, I, what I heard you state is that, that you're already committed to addressing this anyway. And uh, I just want to confirm that that was, was what I heard. I think that is what you heard. Um, we, you know, we, the ISO, will obviously be putting out a roadmap for uh, what stakeholder initiatives we are going to be doing and, and when we're going to be doing them. Um, you know, as we've been discussing, this is certainly not the last chapter on, on storage resources. We're still learning and monitoring storage to see how it performs in the market. We've been thinking about evolutions for um, the actual participation model that we use for storage resources. And we've got some really interesting ideas about how you know, we could advance those. Um, there have been some uh, feedback by the Market Surveillance Committee about some interesting things we could do as, sort of as the next generation of improvements to storage resources. So I encourage you to read their opinion on that. Um, but, but there's a lot more work to do on storage resources. Uh, so we definitely will be tackling you know, all, all the issues that FISTRA is bringing up and then some uh, it's just a matter of, of timing and where that falls in the prioritization of everything else that the ISO is working on. Excellent. Gabe, thank you. Thank you for the questions. Thank you. Um, Elliot, you have your hand up? Yeah, I just wanted to um, just put an exclamation point around a couple of things. You know, stepping back, you know, so far our experience uh, with battery storage in California has been highly successful, right? And I think that the collaborative working relationship with the storage industry from day one has been, I think, outstanding. I think there's a real recognition on our part that we want to try to let the market and the price incentives function as absolutely effectively as possible and, and minimize the need for extraordinary dispatch, exceptional dispatch. And I think that has generally been the case because the batteries are such a significant fraction of the uh, incremental capacity coming onto the system and they're not providing these critical reliability services for the system. We are still in the process, I think, of finding that sweet spot, but particularly with respect to the ancillary services that are so critical to reliability, we do believe that this set of constraints uh, is an important additional step. Our goal is to try to keep them as light-handed as possible, and I think the commitment also is to try to bring more and more data analysis from actual operational experience to inform the level of the constraints that we put on them. And I think that's an essential piece of it as we sort of co-evolve. Uh, and I, I too appreciate the feedback uh, from from Vistra. They've been an important partner, and I think the filing will reflect the independence of these issues. But ultimately, I think this is a good step and something that we will continue to evolve and sharpen over time. And you have my personal commitment on that as well. Thank you, Elliot. Severin, you have your hand up? Yeah, I wanna follow up on something Elliot said and that's been sort of mulling around as we've had this discussion. All of the, every time we get into one of these discussions of restrictions on bids or dispatch or so forth, we are doing this balancing of what Elliot just referred to of letting the market work and maintaining reliability. And I think that there is a larger discussion to have. I mean, I'm going to support this, but I, but about whether we're really at the right point uh, between balancing economic incentives for good performance with direct control and regulation. Uh, my inclination is to think, whether it's RA or here or some other issues that have come up, that there is a tendency to tilt towards uh, not really considering the getting stronger economic incentives as quickly as uh, setting requirements. Uh, and I think in general, we should be thoughtful about 
uh, getting that balance right and keeping the economic uh, incentive mechanisms on the table, uh, including penalty mechanisms for failure to perform. Thank you, Severin. Um, if there's no more questions or comments at this time, I'll turn it over to Adam Swadley from the Department of Market Monitoring. Oh, just uh, Roger Schmidt, Anita had her hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. I did not see that. I, I looked down. Um, Anita, please go ahead. Anita? You're on mute. Hello. I, 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 just, I just want to really underscore the, the point that Severin just made in terms of are we really getting to a point where the market is functioning or are we restricting restricting some of that function? So um, great comment. Excellent. Thank you. Adam, I think you're up now. Okay. Um, thank you and good afternoon. So um, my name is Adam Swadley here today on behalf of the Department of Market Monitoring. Um, as noted in DMM's public board memo and more detailed stakeholder comments, uh, DMM supports the market design changes proposed in the Energy Storage Enhancements Initiative. Um, first, DMM supports each of the ISO's proposed enhancements to improve the availability of ancillary services awarded to energy storage resources. We believe the proposed enhancements will contribute to more feasible market awards of ancillary services for storage resources and will enhance the ability of the real-time market to maintain the feasibility of ancillary service awards from the data market. Um, we do note that in the final proposal, the ISO confirms that it does not yet have a developed approach to calculate the multipliers to be used in the, multi in the modeling of estimated impact of regulation awards in the state of charge. Um, we do recommend that the ISO develop and codify an approach to that before finalizing this particular market design change. On the topic of exceptional dispatch, um, in terms of a required state of charge, DMM supports this enhancement. We believe this will be a significant improvement to the existing processes for storage resources um, and the ISO's proposed opportunity cost based compensation approach for these exceptional dispatches seems reasonable and uh, creates incentives for storage resources to comply with exceptional dispatch instructions. Um, moving on to the proposed enhancements for co-located resources, DMM does not oppose these enhancements. However, we do believe it would be more efficient to reflect tax implications of grid charging and energy PIDs rather than by limiting the ability of resources to, resources to charge from the grid. Um, further, since co-located batteries can be charged from the grid, that can't be charged from the grid will be less flexible and less able to provide capacity during critical hours. Um, we note that these resources should receive a lower resource adequacy capacity rating than storage resources that have the flexibility to charge from the grid. Um, DMM supports the proposal to introduce the opportunity cost component to the day ahead default energy bid for energy storage resources. Um, we believe this proposal is likely to improve the ability of the day ahead market to accurately reflect intraday opportunity costs of storage resources when bid mitigation occurs. Um, we would recommend that in the future, in a future initiative, the ISO also consider a more precise estimate of hourly opportunity cost um, that could reflect changing opportunity costs throughout the operating day. Finally, as we look forward to uh, future initiatives, we just note that DMM does have some ongoing concern about potential big cost recovery gaming opportunities related to battery state of charge. The ISO has recently addressed one energy storage big cost recovery issue through a tariff filing implementing a targeted solution to a very specific issue. However, DMM recommends that in a future stakeholder process, um, the ISO consider more general enhancements to energy storage big cost recovery rules. Um, so in conclusion, DMF supports the ISO's proposed market design changes in the Energy Storage Enhance Enhancements Initiative. Um, thank you, and I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Adam. Any thank questions? You, Adam. Any questions? Uh, I see, Severin, you have your hand up. I, I just want to agree and put a line under, uh, you know, I have expressed this before, that bid cost recovery, I think, is a morass in for all uh, for all resources and tends to create uh, opportunities for strategic behavior. I'm not going to even call it gaming. I think that firms optimize. Um, but I think for storage, it's just mind boggling to me that uh, it's, it's an extremely complex uh, uh, thing to try to do to, uh, to uh, really have a bid cost recovery system that doesn't uh, create opportunities for uh, strategic behavior. And I am really wary of it. 
Thank you, Severin. Can I actually Sam ask a question? Is is bid cost recovery a standard part of ISO markets or is it distinctive to ours? Anna? I'm sorry, I, I didn't. Oh, uh, I, Mark, go ahead, Mark. 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 No. Yeah, I was going to say that this is Mark Rothetter. It's pretty standard in the markets that the, the uh, market results will sometimes uh, not result in full cost recovery of all their uh, bidding mm -hmm. components, including startup and minimum load costs. Uh, and so, yeah, a cost recovery mechanism is, is usually in, incorporated. Thank you. Well, if I can just add in, I since I've had this discussion with Mark and other people at times, it's not just that on a single day, a resource doesn't recover all its startup costs. If that's where all there were to it, I think a good response would have been, you know, on average, you're going to, and there's some risk that you have to absorb. It's that the grid operator actually compels certain behavior in some cases. And that's, am I right, Mark, that that's part of the yeah. justification and that, that yeah a part of the cost recovery is when you end up doing uh, market actions out of market actions like exceptional dispatch and that kind of gets rolled into the cost recovery as well um and so um again other markets it's not unusual to have some kind of mechanism that the operator actions are getting incorporated and those actions are are uh do result in compensation mechanisms. Are they all the same? There probably are some differences at a, at a deeper level. It would be interesting as we move forward, because I see this as a um, potentially growing problem when we start talking about uh, storage, um, to see what other ISOs are doing and to think deeply about how we can confront these potential strategic yeah. issues. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that, as uh, Gabe mentioned, um, no other ISO <laughs> RTO has the, has the scale of uh, storage that we are experiencing. And so we are, we are um, handling them well, we're operating, and they are very helpful, but we are learning as we go. So we are kind of leading the way on this. This is Anna. I did want to follow up with one additional note. Um, you know, we, these are definitely issues as the storage resources continue to grow and the system will be looking at. And one of the areas we'll be looking at bid cost recovery issues more tailored towards storage as well as in the price formation issues. Um, I, I will say that, you know, and to add to Mark's comments with, with regards to other ISOs and RTOs, uh, we certainly are in communication with other ISOs and RTOs as they look at their bid cost recovery uh, rules as well. We will take, you know, we we'll continue to collaborate with everybody and make sure that we are well apprised of their, where they're going with it. But this is an area of new territory for all of us. So it may require some uh, little deeper uh, investigation on our end to make sure that we provide some uh, better analytics and understanding around how the storage resources uh, uh, impact the bid cost recovery. Okay, thank you, Anna. Um, Anita, I see you have your hand up again. I do. Okay. So I, I think I think Severin brings up a really good point, and and I I that's great that there's a working group where there's ways to get some um, responses. But I think this would be a good one for some benchmarking. While California might be leading the charge here, no pun intended, um, it may be a thing of while there while others have smaller magnitudes, they may still have policies that at a larger at a larger practice might be pertinent. And I'm thinking um, internationally as well. So I do think that there's an opportunity to do some benchmarking that would also help us as well as help the ISO. No, that's a very good point, Anita. Uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Decker. Um, that is a very uh, good point. And we will definitely um, you know, look at other practices across the country as well as, as you say, there may be internationally. I know there's other places that have actually experienced within market design, energy market context, you know, the increase of storage as well. So we will definitely take a look at those lessons learned and alternative ways of looking at, at the bid cost recovery as well. Yeah, and, and building on that a little bit, it's also very important to look at the international context, the national context, lessons learned, but also not forget, not lose sight of the fact that California has an incredible leadership role here 
And that as Mark pointed out, we are doing it at a scale that is unprecedented and we have a lot of lessons learned and are operating reliably within a context of bringing in uh, storage at scale. So capturing the ancillary services and ensuring that customers are compensated for that will enable the introduction of additional megawatts um, in an optimized fashion, in my opinion, as well. So um, kudos to you and, and glad to see that this is moving forward. There's always room for improvement and we're going to have many iterations of the programs, but full speed ahead, the more storage we have, the more flexible it is, the more of a good grid citizenship scheme that we have for those um, resources to come online, uh, the better it is for everyone including climate and air quality and reliability. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Angelina. Let's move forward now. We are starting to get um, pretty behind on the schedule. Um, ben Hobbs from the Market Surveillance Committee. Are you online? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you, Ben. OK, thanks. I'll, I'll try to be uh, brief given the hour and given the fact that I have COVID right at the moment. So oh, I'm sorry. Keep... If I keel over, uh, you understand. Um, so good afternoon and thanks for the opportunity to summarize the opinion of the MSC uh, concerning the energy storage enhancements proposal. Uh, we commented on four of the proposal's aspects, which uh, Gabe has already summarized and I'll take them one at a time. Um, so first is about managing storage state of charge when storage provides regulation. So um, a really important issue with the current design for procuring regulation services is that the consequence of failing to deliver day ahead procured regulation in real time is simply no pay. You just have to give back what you were paid day ahead rather than the re requiring the resource buy back its day ahead market schedule at the real time price for regulation. So the proposal's changes are just addressing one manifestation of this underlying basic underlying problem. So we're recommending that consideration be given in the future to penalizing regulation non-performance based on the cost of replacing that regulation or the or the penalty for the constraint in the real time market, whichever applies in a particular market situation. Um, so turning to the changes that are proposed under this aspect, uh, the uh, first is recommendation that the state of charge balance equations in the software be adjusted to account for expected discharge and charge of energy associated with uh, deploying regulation up and down respectively. And we think these are reasonable first order initial approximations that should lessen the likelihood that um, real time state of charge will reach levels that make it infeasible to actually deploy the regulation that you thought you got. Um, but there's always uncertainty around the expected uh, deployment. And um, therefore, we also support the belt and suspenders approach that the ISO proposed, in which there are minimum levels of charging bids and um, discharge energy offers in real time to company regulation up and down respectively. Um, this requirement is needed, we believe, to ensure that the state of charge levels can be maintained uh, that ensure feasibility of deploying that regulation. Uh, the second aspect is exceptional dispatch of uh, storage resources. And there, there are a couple elements to this aspect. Uh, one is giving operators a, tr um, a, a tool to specify minimum state of charge for storage. I realize this is uh, leaning more in the uh, command and control direction rather than price incentives, which will be, I'm sure this will be returned to in the future. But the moment we think it's given the experience and the heat wave that this is a, a tool that is needed. Um, um, the issue of bid cost recovery was uh, discussed just a, a little while ago. And we also support the second element of this part of the proposal that would compensate storage for exceptional dispatch um, by calculating foregone revenues through a, a two counterfactual approach. It's complicated and it's, it diverges from how bid cost recovery is done for other resources. And there are risks, definite risks of unexpected consequences as, uh, as uh, Governor Bornstein has pointed out. 
And for this reason, we recommend that this be watched very carefully for the, its effectiveness and, uh, and possible uh, strategic behavior. Third aspect is co-located storage and variable renewable energy resources. And we'll start by stating our, our disappointment that the investment tax credit provisions of the present tax code, not what the Inflation Reduction Act has, but the present code that uh, applied a lot of resources, have the potential to hobble the ISO's ability to use that storage to maximize system reliability. It's important to recognize and quantify the reduced reliability value of storage resources. It can't be grid charged, as uh, DMM uh, Representative Adam uh, Swedley pointed out. And we support DMM's proposal that, um, that consideration should be given to providing economic incentives for these co-located facilities to grid charge rather than impose a hard constraint to prevent such charging which is what the present proposal would allow resources to choose. Uh, obviously that would take some effort to uh, define and you have to figure out what the opportunity costs of lost investment tax credits are. But um, if that reduction is significant and uh, can impact reliability should be considered. Uh, and fourth and finally, market power mitigation. This is really difficult to do for uh, storage resources because uh, their costs are much more difficult to gauge than in the case of a, a gas plant that has a heat rate and a cost of gas. Um, the proposal to add an opportunity cost component to default energy bids in the day ahead market, it does address an obvious potential for inefficient storage management, as DMM staff and stakeholders have pointed out, uh, that arises from the present system of mitigating hour by hour, looking at individual hours at, at, uh, at offers and potential to um, uh, affect market prices. Um, in our opinion, the overall system of default energy bids in the day ahead market, even with this adjustment, which we think will improve efficiency, is likely to be ineffective entirely in addressing market power that could be exercised by storage. This is because the the system doesn't address um, the left hand as well as the right hand, doesn't address bids to charge and the resulting bid offer spread, which is to, which determines whether storage is used or not. And that bid offer spread can still be readily manipulated to economically withdraw storage from the market. At times, system needs storage for economic and reliability reasons. Now, there's an absence right now of publicly available data on how often and uh, how severely mitigation takes place in the day ahead market. And there's a general lack of understanding um, of how storage can affect the efficiency uh, and payments in, in the ISO markets if it exercises market power. So we can't assess whether the revised day ahead default energy bids in this proposal will result in local market power mitigation whose benefits to consumers will outweigh the schedule and efficiencies that still might result. That is an open question, and uh, we're, this is something that um, I, I know that the ISO intends to return to in the future, and I'm sure we'll be discussing before uh, these boards again. Um, and now I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, um, Ben. Is there any questions for the Market Surveillance Committee for Ben Hobbs? Seeing none, and at this point, uh, Roger, this is Mary. I, I do have a thought. Um, I, I really like this analysis, and I'm curious what the, what um, the staff has to say about these recommendations that are being made, um, because several of them seem quite uh, important. So I'm wondering, Anna, do you have thoughts? Well, I think a lot of the recommendations that um, the MSC has provided are definitely things we'll be looking for and looking at as we consider future enhancements. Um, I do think that for the current market designs, I also wanted to note that it's entirely, uh, it should be expected that as we put in the proposed changes that we'll be watching closely as to how they 
uh, perform in the market. And we're always uh, going to stand ready to take additional action. I think, uh, if, you know, if I understood all the re requests correctly, I think many of these things are for future enhancements that we should be considering, and we definitely will take those under consideration. Um, Anna, the alignment with, with the tax incentives, that seems fairly immediate. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, the, with regards to the tax incentives, I do think that we have, you know, in this, it, it is a particular issue that requires some, um, um, you know, it, it, it does go beyond our ability to change some of that, that stuff. Um, that, but we have made some improvements that I think will align those better. I want to ask Gabe perhaps to provide some additional insight on the tax incentives on the details of that. Yeah, um, th 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 these are really challenging. So essentially, the way that the investment tax credit is, is set up today is it is an incentive to only charge the storage resource when there's energy coming off of the on-site renewable um, and not to charge above you know, the energy that's coming off of the on-site renewable. And as I was saying in my description, sometimes um, as a term of financing, in order to get financing, um, these developers will make, will make uh, promises to try to maximize uh, th those investment tax credits that they're receiving on their projects, and that's the only way they can show an income stream um, to, to be sufficient to ensure that they can get financing. So with those rules in place from a contracting perspective, then... Some, you know, somehow they have to get those rules translated into something that the market can observe, which is to say, gee, we really don't want to ever charge our storage resources more than the energy coming off of on-site renewables, which is, you know, we, even saying it is a mouthful, but actually internalizing that into market constraints is something that is fairly challenging, um, but, but that's what we're doing here in this proposal. Um, I would just note that the Inflation Reduction Act basically puts brand new tax incentives in place for storage resources and, and in fact for all resources that are helping um, uh, grids move towards cleaner generation. And it, it's much less restrictive in terms of what those resources can do once they're built. Um, and, and it's more dependent on actually getting them built, getting them, getting them on the grid, and then the grid operators can basically do what they need. But unfortunately, those investment tax credits are only going to take place for resources that are um, effective on the grid for January 1st, 2025 and later. So the resources that are coming on this year and next year uh, and the year after that won't be included in those new IRA rules, which are much better for the ISO to operate the grid. Uh, a quick suggestion, maybe the working group that's looking at this and resources across the board should proactively try to figure out what's coming down the pipes, not only in terms of investment tax credit, but also the infrastructure plan, because that's going to require a lot of new additional resources to be um, accelerated and their deployment also accelerated um, as well. So maybe making sure that we don't have contradictions like this one, where there's no incentive to operate within our market because they're trying to optimize the financing on the other side. Um, and there should be a little bit better alignment between incentives and financing and reliability of operations across the board. I think that might be a missing link, maybe even on the state and a federal level too. Yeah, and, and we are trying to engage more on those fronts and, and we've even tried to Good. engage retroactively on the ITC rules, um, but, but it's obviously very challenging because those are, those are federal rules um, which are often in place uh, from congressional action. I know, and some of it I think is just basically unintended consequences that happen because um, we don't know what the what the uh, coordination has been, and oftentimes there's very little of it. Absolutely correct, and those rules were passed at a time when there really was no storage in the system, and they and and I think the intention was good, um, but in practice it, it doesn't work out very well. And or we could be thinking about what incentives we could create that, that would get the outcome we want, as they've suggested, the market surveillance has suggested. Are there economic incentives we could offer to secure that power, the reliability of that power? 
access to that power. Of penalties yeah, I, for I, non-performance. <laughs> yeah, well, that yeah, they, I, I they think, suggest. That's already in there. But this is on the incentive, yeah. the carrot side. We're still on the carrot side. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, I, I, I did sort of gloss over this when I was talking. Um, there is a lot of work that we're thinking about internally on, on where we want to go next with storage. I think this is definitely within the realm of ideas that we're thinking about, you know, certainly the things that we can control. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think we're going to run out and, and make a huge run for federal policy, uh, but certainly in terms of how storage resources are incentivized and all resources are incentivized to participate on the grid are things that are at the forefront of what we're thinking about and what we want to include in policy very soon. I'm going to actually make a request. We are actually running quite late at this point, so maybe we should move on to public comment. Yes, you are reading my mind. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so operator, if you can um, open up the lines for public comment. If you would like to make a public comment, you may place yourself in the queue by pressing the raise hand icon on Zoom located at the bottom of your screen. If you're dialed into our phone only lines, you can dial pound two to enter the queue. Moving to our first caller, you have been sent a message to unmute yourself. Please remember to state your name and affiliation. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon and thank you to the Board of Governors and the uh, um, <clears throat> governing body for this opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Sergio Duenas. I am a policy manager for the California Energy Storage Alliance. Uh, CISA represents over 120 companies in the energy storage uh, environment and we are actively engaged in the Public Utilities Commission, the CAISO and other regulatory venues. Um, overall, CISA is supportive of the enhancements considered as part of the Energy Storage Enhancements Initiative. We welcome the ISO's consideration of a successor mechanism to the minimum state of charge requirement, the state of charge exceptional dispatch. We also welcome the implementation of a new electable collocated model to ease compliance with the ITC and the clarifications to the day ahead uh, energy storage default energy bid. This being said, and as CISA has noted in comments throughout the initiative, uh, we do have some concerns with the ancillary service proposals included in this initiative and in the final proposal. While CISA has been supportive of the CAISO's uh, intention to improve the state of charge formula to better reflect the effects of regulation on storage assets, we have certain reservations about the bidding requirement proposal. This is because improving the SOC formula is likely to minimize the likelihood of unfeasible dispatch. It will provide greater reliability and it will minimize the need for out-of-market actions, um, as well as minimizing the need for incremental AES procurement in the real-time market. Because of this, we think that that proposal could largely mitigate the concerns that have been identified uh, in the final proposal. Um, while the CAISO has significantly reformed its bidding requirement proposal, at this point, uh, we consider that that uh, requirement doesn't get to the quid of the issue, which is the market's inability to uh, understand the impacts of regulation. And instead, uh, the latter proposal effectively limits the amount of regulation that a storage asset can provide. Um, notwithstanding, we understand the CAISO's uh, position as a pioneer in the uh, energy storage policy and their uh, responsibility to retain reliability. So we request that if the CAISO is to pursue the bidding requirement proposal, uh, despite the hesitation expressed by stakeholders, staff should properly document how the requirement uh, was derived, the percentage of it, and commit to revising that percentage on an ongoing basis. Uh, we would recommend a yearly basis. Um, overall, uh, finally, we urge the CAISO to continue leading the US in storage policy development and refinement. Uh, CISA and other stakeholders, we've underscored a series of outstanding enhancements related to energy storage. And we think that the only way to address them in a timely manner and stay ahead of the curve of storage deployments is to consider making the energy storage enhancements effort, effort uh, to extend it, perhaps through additional phases. Um, overall, uh, we 
appreciate this opportunity to share our perspective and we look forward to keep working with the CAISO and other stakeholders moving forward. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Operator, I believe we have um, at least one more comment. Moving to the next caller, you have been sent a message to unmute yourself. Please remember to also state your name and affiliation. Hi, uh, this is Kathleen Colbert from Vistra. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so I wanted to thank the governing body, the Board of Governors, CAISO management, uh, CAISO staff, um, for all their efforts in uh, both on and working through this stakeholder process, but also your efforts in um, M very mindfully thinking through this and, and all the robust discussion I think shows how important storage is to the to our current grid and to the future grid right and so we want to thank you for for that um I also want to briefly thank Kaiso for um uh, for acknowledging or identifying that your filing will identify each uh, proposal as an independent Thank you very much for that and being open to that kind of request. Um, I also, on our request to, if this is approved by FERC, the ancillary service proposal to adjust the state of charge value, if that is approved, given our concern that it may result in inefficient market outcomes that could harm storage, and given that we, when this is implemented, will have 750 megawatts of storage exposed to it, it's not an insignificant harm to us. And so we greatly appreciate Gabe. I also heard committing that Kaiso will look into that potential adverse outcome as a normal course of business during its implementation. So we will be as engaged as we can through that process and work closely with staff, continue to collaborate. And I uh, I think we're great partners. And so I continue well committed to continuing that relationship um, through the implementation process as well. Um, on the final ask Thank that you, we Kat. had, oh yeah, you're welcome. On the final ask that I had, I wanted to provide the governing body and board with more context. When we took a step back, we thought about how important your role is in informing Kaiso priorities. Um, on what you know, Kaiso has limited resources, um, and and there's so many important things. And so the reason that we wanted to make this ask on on you providing some input and kind of helping to inform Kaiso's priorities for 2023 and beyond is because we think you play a really important role, um, bringing your perspective from what's important um, to the health and well-being of the organization. And we think storage is a growing and a growing part of the fleet and it's becoming more increasingly more important to support reliability. And so we appreciate I appreciate so much, Elliot, your commitment to continuing to work on the storage operational issues. Anna, Gabe, thank you, as always, for your continued efforts. Um, I uh, Sergio's suggestion just now for, for alignment that this needs to be a phased effort, and we need to continue maybe extending this project to address these other challenges. That makes sense to us, and so we can support that. That's your direction, but you provide a huge value in informing the priorities. And so as you think through those um, policy priorities that will come to you next quarter, we just ask that you keep storage in mind and how important it is and help provide that feedback to Kaiso if you agree. Um, again, thank you very much. That's it. Happy to take any questions, but I know we're running over. <laughs> no, I, Kathleen, I, thank I, you. Kat, th thanks for the comments. We appreciate the partnership and yeah, absolutely. And, and we look forward to the feedback from our governing entities and we'll continue to keep a full press ahead working with you and continuing to evolve together. So thank you for your comments. We really appreciate it. Are there any other public comments? There are no further comments in the queue at this time. Thank you. Anna, I see you have your hand up before we go to a motion. I will be brief. I just wanted to respond to Sergio's comment and request that we evaluate the configurable element on the bidding requirement. We certainly will do that on an annual basis. We'll, and then we'll share whatever we see from that with stakeholders. Just wanted to respond to that. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Is there any other comments or questions from the, uh, the board or the governing body? Or shall we move this to a motion?
Excellent, thank you. Uh, move that the ISO Board of Governors and the WEIM governing body approve the energy storage enhancements described in the memorandum dated December 7, 2022. And move that the ISO Board of Governors and the WEIM governing body authorize management to make all necessary and appropriate filings with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to implement these changes, including any filings that implement the overarching initiative policy but contain discrete revisions to incorporate commission guidance in any initial ruling on the proposed tariff amendment. May I have a motion, please? So move. Second. I'll second. Thank you. Chair Bogwa, your vote, please. Aye. Governor Borenstein. Aye. Member Campbell. Yes. Member Decker. Yes. Governor Galitiba. Aye. Vice Chair Gardner. Aye. Chair Konzioka. Aye. Vice Chair Leslie. Aye. Member Prescott. Aye. And Governor Shorey. Aye. Thank you, governors and governing body members. The motion does pass. Our next thank item on the yes, thank you everyone. That was a um, very informative and very good discussion. Our next item on the agenda is our briefing on the extended day ahead market initiative. And um, Anna McKenna, would you like to introduce the topic, please? Yes, I have the pleasure of introducing all topics today. Um, <laughs> it is my pleasure to introduce Milos Bosnak, their ISO's regional market sector manager, he's gonna be providing you with an overview of our extended day ahead market uh, proposal, which will be presented to you in February for approval. Um, I wanted to note that when we set off this mark design, we took particular uh, effort to make sure that it was conducted closely with stakeholders, because of course this effort consists of, you know, extending our day ahead market to our regional par par partners. I wanted to express my gratitude and appreciation for everyone's participation and in particular, I want to say, you know, recognize the amount of effort and ingenuity that went into um, this effort in designing uh, our proposal here. Uh, but before we proceed, I also wanted to take a, a moment to congratulate Milos and his excellent efforts on leading us through the smart design effort. I'm not sure he actually realized what he was getting into when he started, but uh, Milos has done a fantastic job in delivering a highly collaborative and integrated stakeholder process. You know, his keen abilities to listen, coordinate, track, question, synthesize, and document the evolution of the market design is, is admirable and should be commended and recognize it, recognized. And I want to take a moment to do so. Thank you, Milos, for all your efforts. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Milos. All right. Thank you, Anna. And uh, Chair Bagua, Chair Kanzioka, and yeah, I'm governing body members and ISO Board of Governors. Thank you again for the opportunity to brief you on the status of the EDAM initiative as we recently published the final proposal on December 7th after, as Anna noted, extensive stakeholder engagement and going through a number of iterations uh, of the proposal. If we can go to the next slide, I'll, I'll jump right into it. Um, but just a little bit of background on the EDAM, just level set, but the EDAM initiative describes a design for extending the day ahead market across the Western interconnection to optimally commit generation in the day ahead timeframe to serve uh, expected next day needs. Uh, through that optimization and broader visibility into the conditions across the footprint, the EDAM can build upon and provide incremental economic, reliability, and environmental benefits to those derived in the EIM today. Um, I do want to highlight that similar to the EIM today, um, participation by balancing areas, by EIM entities in the EDAM, they continue to retain some of the key functions that they do in the EIM today, and it's primarily their resource planning function, their transmission planning function, and the management of reliability within, within their own balancing area. Uh, the ISO as the market operator doesn't uh, take on those obligations, but those remain in the sole purview of each one of those entities that participate in the EDAM. We can go to the next slide, please. I'll just quickly highlight some of the, some of the benefits, but I think the EIM has demonstrated the value of regional coordination and collaboration. Uh, and the EDAM builds on that by providing further economic reliability and environmental benefits from an economic perspective, as I noted, the day ahead market will seek to position the footprint in that day ahead time frame through optimized unit commitment to cost effectively meet next day demand, which should derive benefits for the balancing area uh, and its load serving entities. 
there are also important reliability benefits. An extended day ahead market will provide the market operator and its participants with improved visibility into the conditions across the footprint, namely resource and transmission availability on a day ahead basis. And this visibility allows then the market to position the footprint efficiently to meet those next day conditions to the extent there's anticipation of stress conditions, particularly if, if that balancing area or multiple balancing areas are expecting those more stress conditions. Uh, visibility of and access to a broader supply. One second. No. No. Uh, visibility of and access to a broader supply pool in the day ahead market can decrease the frequency and magnitude of system emergency declarations as well by individual balancing areas, since there may be sufficient supply through that visibility, there may be sufficient supply in the footprint to cost effectively position that supply to manage the next day expected stress system conditions. But it also provides more flexibility in responding to changes in conditions between day ahead uh, and real time. And then finally, I'll note that from an environmental perspective, an extended day ahead market uh, continues to build on the benefits of the EIM through efficient resource commitment, including commitment of renewable resources in the day ahead time frame. Uh, that excess renewable generation in one balancing area can be committed to serve load in the footprint uh, during different times of day, uh, reducing the need to curtail excess renewable generation. Um, as well, the EDAM design allows for uh, the market to respect, as, I, as I'll talk about later, the evolving state regulatory frameworks, such as greenhouse gas emission accounting. We can go to the next slide. I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide. I think you've seen it in the past in previous briefings, but it's really intended to illustrate the breadth and the scope of different key design areas. There are more than these that are listed on this slide, but I think these are some of the more notable issues that, that we've been trying to work through. And we cover the design of a day ahead resource efficiency evaluation and how supply is made available to the market, all the way to how transmission is made available to support transfers between uh, EDAM balancing areas and how those resources and transmission that's made available, how that's optimized by the market to support efficient transfers. Uh, we also sought to provide a design that instills confidence in transfers between balancing area areas, uh, that these are reliable and dependable, including particularly under stress system conditions, since participating entities uh, will be relying on these transfers between balancing areas to ensure uh, reliable service to load. And then we also spent some time on greenhouse gas accounting in the EDAM, and we looked at different design options, uh, striving for compatibility with existing regulatory programs, but allowing also for scaling in that design to be compatible with emerging regulatory programs. Okay, we can go to the next slide. I want to spend just a little bit of time highlighting a couple of elements on these next two to three slides uh, of the design, but an important element of the overall EDAM design has been the introduction of a day ahead resource efficiency evaluation that tests that participating entities at a balancing authority area level, that they have sufficient supply offered into the market to meet their next day obligations, particularly their forecasted load, uh, along with uncertainty requirement and ancillary services. But a day ahead resource efficiency evaluation, I, I do want to highlight that it's different than resource adequacy. Resource adequacy is the consideration of longer term procurement paradigms to meet more seasonal, annual, or maybe even month ahead needs. Uh, but the sufficiency evaluation that we're introducing here really tests the availability of supply to meet those next day conditions based upon a more specific forecast and anticipations of conditions for the next day. Uh, the day ahead sufficiency evaluation then tests that sufficiency for each balancing area across a 24 hour horizon and their ability to meet those next day obligations. I think it's also important to highlight that a, that a day ahead resource sufficiency evaluation was an important concept, recognizing that there are different resource adequacy programs uh, around the West. There's a California program, there's an emerging Western resource adequacy program, and then there's entities that may have their own individual resource planning or resource adequacy programs. And a day ahead resource sufficiency evaluation really provided a common test in that next day, day ahead time frame that entities have that sufficient supply coming into the day ahead uh, time frame to meet their next day obligations and ensure that then the resulting resource commitments that come out of the market, uh, that those transfers are also the result of economic displacement. The evaluation also, also ultimately uh, seeks to avoid leaning as well between balancing areas and incense that forward procurement uh, 
so that entities are coming in sufficient and meeting that sufficiency uh, in the day ahead time frame, much as we would expect, and as we've heard throughout the stakeholder discussion, much as uh, a prudent balancing area as a prudent load sharing entity does today um, on their own. Um, I also do want to note that EDAM entities, an important element of the design was that EDAM entities that pass that day ahead resource sufficiency evaluation then will be evaluated together as a pool in the EIM hourly resource sufficiency uh, evaluation. That was also another benefit of the design that we've put forward uh, that also arise for uh, certain derivation of a diversity benefit uh, associated with imbalance reserves that can be shared among the uh, EDAM entities. But I think another key element here in the middle of the slide uh, is, is that we work with stakeholders, and this is probably the item that we spent the most time on iterating between proposals, but we work with stakeholders to introduce a financial consequence for failing the day ahead resource sufficiency evaluation that instead coming insufficient uh, insufficient into that day ahead time frame. Uh, we developed different tiers of financial consequences that vary in size uh, of the surcharge based upon the, upon the magnitude of the failure and also seek to account for persistency uh, of failures. Again, all with the intent of uh, seeking to ensure that entities are doing that forward procurement to come insufficient into the day ahead time frame. We can go to the next slide. On the transmission front, the design seeks to maximize the transmission that's made available to the day ahead market to support energy transfers between EDAM balancing areas, but it also seeks to respect the existing transmission rights as much as possible. From, from the transmission perspective, we're really seeking to harmonize the open access transmission tariff framework that's prevalent across the West that has different types of transmission products, different durations of transmission products with different attributes. Uh, and we're trying to harmonize that within the organized market where really all transmission is made available to support that optimization and optimal transfers. Under the design, we've put forward a framework where both transmission customers that hold transmission rights as well as the transmission provider make transmission available. The transmission customers that hold transmission contracts, uh, they have different pathways of making those transmission rights available to the EDAM, um, whether they can utilize those rights in the day ahead market or they can otherwise make it available to the market but they nevertheless retain the ability to come back later uh, after the ahead market has run and exercise those rights if necessary similarly the transmission provider makes unsold transmission available to support those edam transfers at interfaces between edam balancing areas finally a, a key element of the design as well was providing a framework for edam transmission providers to recover historical transmission revenues to the extent that they see a reduction in sales of certain shorter term transmission products as a result of EDAM participation. And similarly for the ISO, to the extent that there are reductions in, in uh, what we call wheeling access charge uh, revenues um, across the ISO. Okay, one more slide, I think. Okay. So on the greenhouse gas front, um, the greenhouse gas emissions accounting design has been another key element that we've spent significant time working on with stakeholders. And uh, we consider different options or approaches throughout the different discussions, all the way from the working groups to the different iterations of the proposals. A key consideration was ensuring that the EDAM, EDAM greenhouse gas accounting design can support current and evolving regulatory uh, emission pricing programs around the West. Uh, while we considered multiple options throughout the design, we ultimately are proposing to extend the current EIM greenhouse gas accounting design, or what we call the resource specific approach, extending that to the EDAM with some limited enhancements. Uh, this is a design that current EIM participants are familiar with. It was the most defined at the time and implementable option, and it aligned also with existing state air regulatory requirements. So we thought that this would be a, a reasonable approach to start off the EDAM with. But nevertheless, uh, we're open and we've noted this publicly and noted in the paper as well. We're certainly going to be monitoring uh, after operations of the EDAM and as the regulatory structures around the West evolve, we're certainly open to evolving that design and even considering some of the prior options that we've evaluated throughout the initiative. We've introduced some limited enhancements as well to this framework, the, the EIM framework that we're extending to the EDAM. Uh, primarily seeking to limit secondary dispatch, which is when the optimization may attribute lower emitting resources to serve demand in a GHG emission pricing area, but may backfill then with higher emitting resources to serve demand 
in a non-GHG area. So we've introduced some enhancements there that, that we try to work with stakeholders on those, and um, we think that those make sense as a starting point uh, in the EDAM. Okay, I think, yeah, so the next slide is just the, the EDAM milestones to give you a sense of what's coming up next. But as I said, we published the draft final, the final proposal on, on December 7th. Then uh, in February is when we're planning to bring this item for decision uh, to, to the joint uh, ISO Board of Governors and EM governing body decision. And then we would be starting our tariff drafting process and the stakeholder process associated with that, translating that design into the tariff here in the first quarter of 2023, ultimately being ready to file that design with FERC in quarter two of 2023. Ultimately, we would work on implementation activities throughout 2023, but based on coordination with interested entities is really when we would envision uh, defining particularly uh, the start date or the onboarding date of entities that are interested in the EDAM. Uh, it would really depend upon those discussions of entities that may indicate interest in participating in the EDAM. So with that, I think that closes my, my briefing to you and I can certainly uh, answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Milos. Let me note, um, which I neglected to do at the beginning, that we did receive a public comment letter that was provided to the board and the governing body from the Clean Energy Buyers Association that was associated with this briefing. So I wanted to make sure I noted that for the record. Uh, before we go to public comment, is there any uh, comments or questions from the board or the governing body? Uh, Governor Bornstein? Yeah, I'll be quick. I know it's late. Um, I am. Uh, I, I see a trade-off having, a, as I mentioned earlier, uh, resource sufficiency evaluation in a day ahead market. On the one hand, I can see how it could prevent someone from coming in insufficient. On the other hand, that's what markets are for. And it seems like we are sort of kneecapping this market if we tell everyone they have to come in sufficient. We're pushing the obligation to reach a balanced uh, schedule uh, before the day ahead market. I see it, I understand the trade-off. At this point, I'm not convinced that's the right trade-off. And I hope that I will become convinced if that's how the final proposal comes to us. We, Severin, I'm just going to step in and tell you we will we will get to work on that with you. Make sure that we'll forward you all the some of the, all the comments and all the information about the primacy of resource sufficiency. I think I understand your fundamental concern, but my I think as we get deeper into the details, I think you'll see that uh, we're certainly trying to set up a market that could be highly functional, but just making sure that we have the necessary accountability mechanisms that also can work in tandem with the California resource adequacy paradigms and the Western resource adequacy program. So the sufficiency element is is quite central to the structure, but let's make sure as we as we socialize this and get further and further into the details in the next year that we're addressing your concerns. Okay. Governor Leslie, I see you have your hand up. Yes, I, <clears throat> I have a question for Milos. Milos, given what you just said about the competitive nature of of this particular product, you know, this whole program, the EDM, what, what do you think our strategic advantage is are? Uh, versus our our competitors. What what are the things that, that is it the size of our market? Is it the what, what makes what makes the EDAM appealing? Why do you join the EDAM? Yeah, and a great question. I think I think it goes back to some of those benefits that I highlighted um, at the beginning. The proven benefits that I think we've seen in the EIM from both a economic perspective as well as from a reliability perspective, I think a key benefit is, is that reliability aspect of having visibility across the broader footprint in the day ahead time frame to be able to manage uh, grid conditions. I'm not up to speed necessarily on, on the design elements of other regional markets uh, across, the, across the, the West, but I think uh, those benefits, reliability, economic benefits that I think we've proven in the EIM and extending those to the EDAM is really what provides that, that uh, value proposition. Okay, Milos, I wanna know how adorable the child is that is near you or... <laughs> sorry, we have sorry, no she, time she, for she, adorable she, children. Yeah. What? We have no time for cute children right now. Oh, I'm so sorry, <laughs> Thank you. 
you. Yeah, I'm here, there. Thank you for sharing me. That was your adorable daughter. Thank you. Mary, I'm just gonna really briefly as we move into the last questions. I mean, I, I think it's I think you're asking a you know non-trivial question, right? So it's important. I mean, and, and so the central thesis is I mean the Western energy imbalance market has now been in operation for over eight years and I think has three billion dollars worth of cumulative benefits to electricity ratepayers around the West based off the premise of coordination across a wide transmission geographically diverse resource portfolio. And, and that experience of those physics and those economics has been the impetus behind the day ahead market and structuring it in a way that, that provides the necessary accountability mechanisms as we discussed, optimizes transmission in a multi-BA context, and ultimately op opens up even greater opportunity for economic and environmental value. So I think we've, we are fortunate to have fabulous transmission partners. Obviously last week uh, with the announcement by Pacific Core uh, multi-state utility, uh, warning, you know, our first, our first EIM, op our first EIM adopter now stepping in uh, as the first adopter of EDAM. I think that's extremely important that we continue to build that wide area optimization, which I think we are very convinced by all the studies uh, that have been put out that if we continue to optimize across that footprint, we're going to see even greater reliability as we saw during the September heat wave, and we're going to bend the cost curve during a time when rate payers are experiencing a lot of upward pressure. So that's the thesis, and uh, we're extremely appreciative of all the partnerships and, and really excited to go into 2023 and bring this back to you all for an official vote in early February. Hey, let's see, do we have no more, no more questions at the moment? So let's go ahead, operator, if we can, and open it up for public comment. Make a public comment, please press the raise hand icon on Zoom located at the bottom of your screen or pound two on our phone only line. Moving to the first caller, you've been sent a prompt to unmute yourself. Please remember to state your name and affiliation. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great, thank you. My name is Stephen Pruitt. I am the Manager of Emerging Markets and Energy Settlements for the LA Department of Water and Power. And uh, I would like to pass on a message that LADWP would like to express its appreciation to everyone involved in this EDAM design. The, uh, the final proposal for EDAM is a culmination of hard work and engagement uh, by the CAISO and stakeholders like LA. Since the initial straw proposal came out in uh, April earlier this year, um, LA would also like to express its gratitude for the new revised stakeholder process adopted by the CAISO for, uh, for this development and believes that this process was integral in expeditiously getting to a solid and very workable EDAM design proposal. Um, although we know much work remains to be done uh, ahead of EDAM Go Live, LA is excited to continue to be part of this development. And uh, LAWP believes that not only will this new market yield significant savings across the West, but also contribute to lowering GHG emissions significantly. So we're, we're very grateful to have been part of this process and look forward to continue to being so. Thank you. A million, Stephen. Any other public Moving. comment? Moving to the next caller in the queue. Caller, you've been sent a prompt to unmute yourself. Please remember to state your name and affiliation. Uh, great. This is Kathleen Colbert from Bitstrap. Can you hear me? Sorry, I always get worried. We can. Okay, great. <laughs> the mute unmute thing is tricky. Um, perfect. Uh, briefly, so, you know, there's not a great deal of clarity on what like the process is for stakeholders necessarily to like provide input to the governing body um, or the board of governors. As you know, it's 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 more submit the letter and, and kind of participate. But given the importance of this effort um, of EDAM, and it's not just EDAM, right? It's also the governance, um, their DAME is related, all coming to you next at the next meeting. I just I I wanted to tee up and see if you have any guidance on how you would like to receive stakeholder input um, in like in what manner, in what timeline, so that you feel like you would be most prepared for that meeting. So that's 
And I have a suggestion, but first I just want to see if you have any responses to that question. I think our general, this is Ash Bhagwat, mm -hmm. um, the board chair. Um, I think our general view is, is that while we've always been happy to meet with stakeholders, getting input in a for formalized way, letters actually are effective, but they really ideally would arrive a week before the meeting so that we can absorb them and sort of <clears throat> really raise the issue. Um, and I, it, I'm curious to hear if anyone else disagrees. I would go further and say they are pretty much useless in informing the board for a meeting if they arrive the day before. Uh, I, you know, if you want to influence the board for later discussions, that's one thing, but sending a letter the day before and expecting the board to respond to it is not realistic. Uh, this is Rob. Um, I'm going to echo what uh, Ash had to say is, is um, yeah, uh, in writing makes it easier for, for everyone to see the same information. And uh, the sooner the better, more than a week in advance is important. Um, and then lastly, yes, the, the governing body members are, are willing to, to meet and, and discuss um, items that you may have and we'll work with you. But uh, having it in writing, I think, is much more valuable. Great, thank you. Um, my suggestion, and another question I have for you is, as we've been thinking about what is the role of the RIF, uh, one of the things that I wanted to see if you had any feedback on is, do you think it would be useful for a more informal space if the RIF were willing or inclined to set up, let's say, a virtual meeting uh, and offer up to any stakeholders who would like to kind of go over their, share their views or their, their perspectives on anything coming up on the next board meeting? If we were to provide a forum like that, do you see that as consistent with the role of the RIF? Would that have value? Yes, I got my hand up. Go ahead, Nita, and I'll go afterwards. Yeah. So I think um, remembering that the RIF is a function of the governing bodies mm -hmm. um, structure, I would say, um, you know, that's that's a question we'd have to talk with Roger about in terms of it wouldn't be informing the whole board. It would be mm -hmm. non-quorum. So mm -hmm. you've got the non-quorum issue. Um, and again, you, that you're part of the governing bodies governance versus the joint boards governance. So I think mm -hmm. there's a, a question there as well. Um, I think there's a lot of ways um, that you can put things in, um, similar to the comments for the GRC. And, and individually, I think, talk with different members. Um, so that's that would be my thoughts. My audio cut out a little bit, so um, yeah. I well, it wasn't just me, um, Kathleen. I would, you know, I would just say that that we, the governing body, are interested in what Riff has to say. I think Anita covered some of the issues that we would have to work around, um, but but yes, um, we are interested in in what Riff would like to provide input on. We don't want to direct or even have um, um, any type of influence on what RIF wants to do. And let me just suggest that at this point, we might want to move along and um, stick if there's any more questions regarding the EDAM briefing. Um, we're happy to take this offline with you and have discussions on how we can make the RIF most effective. We've, we've had those type of stakeholder discussions before and, and we certainly would um, welcome. Under six, let me just close out, Roger, which is that as a liaison, um, I just was looking for input to know if there was enough interest for me to take that back to the committee. That's no, the next step, so I'll take that back. Thank you. Fair enough. Appreciate that. Are there any other public comments? I, I, no, that's good. I think we're good. Thank you. I'm oh, sorry, Roger. I think we've we've responded to the question. Thanks. Yes. Yes. So I'm looking at the other comments. Yeah. If there's any other yep. callers. Yep. Of course. Okay. There are no further public comments in the queue at this time. Music to my ears. Thank you very much. So I think um, we are done, unless there is anything else that I'm missing, and I'm going to assume not seeing no hands up. 
And we can now move on to the briefing on the WEIM Governance Review Committee Extended Day Ahead Market Governance Proposal. And Stacy Crowley will introduce that. Stacy. Good afternoon, um, governing body and board of governors. I am just here to quickly introduce members of the Governance Review Committee who will provide a briefing on their draft final proposal that they posted um, on December 7th. And Rebecca Wagner, the uh, sitting chair of the GRC, is going to kick us off. So I'll hand it over to Rebecca. Thank you, Stacy, and um, good almost evening to um, the board and body members. Um, I'm going to try and be quick, and I'm not going to do most of this I, today. I'm going to be joined by Jeff Nelson from Southern Cal Edison and Pam Sporberg from Portland General Electric. And I'll have Eric Eisenman and Tony Braun on phone a friend status um, to help with any questions. Um, and they're both here. Um, just quickly, as I was preparing for this, I looked back at your meeting at last year at this time. And um, our chair, Therese Hampton, had um, let you all know that the GRC was um, standing, willing, ready, and able to take on EDAM governance. Um, not long after that meeting, we got started in earnest, um, and which has resulted in our draft proposal that was posted on uh, December 7th. Um, as you can imagine, uh, we received a lot of input in, in general sessions, as well as extended outreach to um, all of the sectors and throughout the region. Um, Losing, losing uh, Therese in September was a blow to the GRC, um, but the, my colleagues on the GRC and the ISO staff, everybody stepped up um, so that we could fulfill our mission and, and make Therese proud. And I think it's safe to say on behalf of the GRC, we are proud of our work um, and what we've accomplished in a short amount of time. And that's not casting aspersions on what the market design folks had to do. Um, that was a really heavy lift. Um, as, as you can imagine, developing our, our governance proposal for EDAM was a balancing act, and we had a lot of needles to thread. Um, and in this vein, I just want to pull out two sentences from our fantastic read of a draft proposal, um, because I think it really sums things up. And I quote, um, it is not possible to establish a set of rules that fully satisfies all stakeholders or that can foresee and address all future issues that may arise. Our overarching goal has been instead to create a foundation that fosters sufficient trust and collaboration among all parties to enable EDAM and its governance to succeed and evolve over time in much the same way has occurred with the Western in, in balance mar energy imbalance market. So on that note, please advance the slide. Um, this is our, the, those of us who are left standing, um, we've had an evolution of members over time, and um, but still, still going strong. Next slide, please. And now I'm going to tee this section up to um, with Jeff Nelson. He's going to go through this section, um, and then Pam the following sections, and I'll jump back in at the end to to finish it off. And we'll take any questions. Although you know um, you don't have to ask any, but we can always answer them for you. Um, all right. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Nelson, who is actually um, on video, which good to see you, Jeff. Yeah. Yes, uh, rarely does uh, Zoom get through our firewall, but I'm here today. Uh, good afternoon uh, to everyone out there on the, the governing body and the board. Uh, thanks for the opportunity of presenting. Uh, Jeff Nelson uh, representing the GRC. So we're gonna talk about the delegation of authority and some of the evolution we've had from uh, the original thinking. In broad strokes, we're maintaining the same joint authority construct that was uh, approved and implemented for EDAM. Uh, and we're basically, the rules are, if a rule applies to an EDAM market participant, then that is going to fall under joint authority. We have expanded a little bit beyond that for some price formation issues. Uh, we're not asking or proposing any changes for the decisional classifications of initiatives. So the determination of what's joint and what's not is going to stay the same process. And there's no change for resolving disagreements. Uh, 
when uh, approved tariff changes with a joint authority or whether or not they're in there. So it's really a definition of what applies and a little bit of expansion as we'll talk to on if in an advisory role, there are some, uh, there are some disagreements. Could we get the next slide, please? So this is, this is a mouthful and I'm not going to read it word for word, but I'll point out some highlights in this. Uh, it's based on the existing EDAM language, the first multiple sentences with, uh, excuse me, the, the EIM language, I may have misspoke, so to include EDAM with uh, the Western EIM language. And the rule is if it applies to people, it will be part of joint authority. And then we added some additional clauses here about midway through uh, that the board may establish rules or it'll be joint that directly establishes or change the formation of locational marginal prices for a product that's common. And uh, some clarification here that any rules that are exclusively part of the ISO's balancing authority, uh, those will not be under joint authority. So uh, maybe we can go to the next slide. I'll try to pull out some of the, some of the nuances here. Um, I want to focus on that directly establishes or changes price formation. The, the document we put out has a pretty good discussion in there, and it really is sort of twofold. First, the idea was that uh, there might be a product that was common, let's just say energy. It was common to the entire EDAM market. And for some reason, the ISO might choose to put special rules, for example, hard price caps or some spe special form of market power mitigation. Uh, that only apply to, for example, the ISO. Because it's for a common product, that could have uh, sort of direct impacts on price formation outside of the ISO. And it was sort of that direct linkage where it was a common product, that there might be special rules and one balancing authorities, particularly the ISO. We felt it was appropriate to put that under joint authority uh, because the products were so linked and the price formation was so linked. On the other hand, if the product was not common, let's just say ancillary services, uh, only those only are in the ISO and we're not doing pricing for ancillary service elsewhere, uh, those rules would not be subject to joint authority if there were some special ISO rules, which I guess there are since only ISO does ancillary services. It's not a common product. So that was the thrust there, common products directly impacting the price formation. Uh, we expanded that to be joint authority. And as noted, ISO BA specific rules are still excluded from joint authority. Okay, we'll go to the next slide if we could. Uh, this is going beyond uh, what's gonna be advisory authority, but some enhancements, uh, excuse me, beyond joint authority to advisory authority. And I noted this in the beginning, we wanna enhance that process a bit. Uh, there was discussion on what happens in an advisory role if the governing body is, is, is not in agreement with the direction that's going. What, what do we do about that? And what we've recommended here is that if that happens, if there is an advisory sort of to go against, that we want to have additional process and communication between the governing body and the ISO's board through joint session to ensure that that item is provided and discussed in joint session in front of both bodies so that everyone understands uh, what the concerns are, what's happened before, again, this will be a, a, an advisory role. So the ISO board will be voting on this uh, before the ISO takes that vote. And hopefully conversations have happened prior to the day before the board votes. But uh, if it is bubbling up, there's communication and understanding. We wanna make sure there's extra process in this, in this instance. And if the board uh, moves forward anyways, for, for, for whatever reason, the board moves forward with that, we want to give the governing body uh, the ability to get their concerns voiced also in front of FERC. And that means they'd have the right, in this case, in our recommendation, to hire some outside assistance that they needed to, to prepare written comments and be filed at FERC. And that's sort of an enhancement uh, to the current advisory authority. So those are the main changes that I was going to talk about in this portion. Uh, Rebecca, do you want me to pause for questions or do we want to keep plowing through? Yep. Let, let's keep plowing through um, and we'll go ahead at, and tee up Pam. Um, are you ready? Great, thank you. 
Yes. Hello, Rebecca. Can you hear me? Yes. So uh, thank you all for the opportunity to share um, on the Governance Review Committee. And I'll note that originally this time slot was before my team's holiday party, and now it is after my team's holiday party. So um, I'm standing outside of the venue. If there's any ambient noise, I apologize. So I'm going to first talk about the Governance Review Committee size and composition of the governing body. And if we could go to slide uh, nine. Um, so the Governance Review Committee continues to recommend that the governing body should remain at five members um, and that this is an issue that we can continue to revisit, but that for now the size and composition of the governing body seems commensurate with the scope of the EDAM and that the EIM governing body and EDAM um, are both, uh, the governing body has had the engagement and um, outreach with the stakeholder community that will continue to provide the appropriate engagement for the EDM market as well. Um, we also have a recommendation that as governing body members are renominated, that there is a component of the existing process where the nominating committee will evaluate the enhanced scope of the EDAM in line with the, the members' uh, experience and skill set uh, to recommend, to, to enhance or fulfill the re full recommendation of uh, renominating that member for an additional term. Uh, this is a, a part of the current process that already exists for renominating a uh, seated governing body member but really layers in the EDAM components of that evaluation to ensure that the skills and um, experience of that governing body member are commensurate with the enhanced scope of the role. And finally, we encourage the CAISO management to uh, study compensation of the governing body in 2023 and, and ensure that, that the compensation remains commensurate with other board memberships of a similar nature and scope. Moving on to the next section, uh, we'll talk about stakeholder engagement um, and policy development. And on uh, the next slide for the recommendations, um, we, the Governance Review Committee recommends that the current stakeholder engagement framework be maintained through EDAM. This is a diffuse model of stakeholder engagement that has been really working for EIM and ensures that all stakeholders have an opportunity to be heard and participate in the stakeholder development process. We also encourage the ISO to continue to use the working group model when the complexity of a particular stakeholder initiative warrants the usage of that model. We find that the additional engagement of the working group provides valuable input from the stakeholder community, but we recognize that that input needs to be balanced with the additional burden that those working groups entail in terms of time commitment and engagement to really uh, dig into that particular stakeholder initiative. So we think that this is a valuable tool when warranted, but that it should be used judiciously uh, for those initiatives that could really benefit from the working group model. And finally, we um, encourage the risk to continue to use the, to, to have an open forum with all stakeholders for the prioritization process of stakeholder initiatives. We think this is a valuable forum for getting stakeholder input on the initiative roadmap and that the RIF is really a good forum and opportunity to really give stakeholders a voice in that prioritization process and gives the ISO an opportunity to hear directly from stakeholders about which initiatives are critical for different stakeholder communities uh, before the prioritization is really set for the next year. We think this is a good enhancement to the current roadmap process and offer stakeholders more opportunity to influence and be heard through that process. And finally, we recommend adding one new sector liaison 
to the Regional Issues Forum that represents specifically EDAM entities. And we think that EDAM entities offer um, a, a specific perspective or specific stakeholder uh, considerations that warrant their own representative that might be unique from an EDAM and, or an EIM entity's perspective and that that will enhance the value and, um, and perspectives really heard through the Regional Issues Forum. And finally, we want to really give our thanks to the GRC or to the, the GRC would like to thank the Regional Issues Forum for their engagement, extensive comments, and uh, convening of a stakeholder dialogue on governance issues and the role of the risk in the governance process. We recognize the risk has an opportunity to evolve and grow into the new scope and authority that was granted in the first round of GRC recommendations. And we encourage the governing body, stakeholders, and all of this community to continue to partner with the risk so that the risk can really grow into that full enhanced role um, and that that is a an evolution not a revolution and that we all have a role to play in encouraging the risk to continue to expand its its authority and engagement in the stakeholder process and with that i think i'll turn it back to rebecca or do next i have Pam? one more slide you you have one more slide can we go to the next slide please Oh, I do. Two I bullets, apologize. you're doing great. Uh, <laughs> so finally, our last recommendation is to amend the KISO bylaws to clarify consistent with corporate purpose and statutes that KISO Okay, Pam, we lost you. I'm gonna, for the sake of time, I'm gonna jump in here um we're ensuring that the bylaws making the point that um to to amend the bylaws to comport with um corporate purpose and status of a non-profit public benefit corporation in weighing all interests of stakeholders and, and those who participate in the market um, and amend the bylaws to add the same ob obligation for individual members of the board of governors um, I see Governor Shorey has her hand up, so I'll bounce it back to um, the ISO to take questions for us. Oh, and I'm muted. Thank you, um, Rebecca. I really appreciate that um, succinct but very informa informing presentation. Governor Shorey, do you have a, your hand up? Yes, I know it's getting really late. Uh, yeah. I <laughs> just want to start by thanking the GRC again. I know that there has been a huge amount of work and it's really been, I think more than two years at this point. And so you've come such a long way. So congratulations, <laughs> we're getting very close here. Um, I wanted to, it's really more a question for Roger, I think. I was interested in this last recommendation on the amendments to the CAISO bylaws. Uh, and in looking at the proposal, which is now available on the ISO's website that I think you'll be discussing further with your stakeholder group, there is a, an appendix where the ISO's legal staff actually looked at both the California law provisions that apply to the ISO as, as well as um, our own bylaws. And the, so the corporate uh, incorporation rules of being incorporated in California, plus the California Public Utilities Code requirements. So Roger, I was hoping that perhaps you could just touch quickly on the findings that came out in your analysis and why this recommendation will be appropriate for us to consider. Yes, um, well, uh, let me just say that um, to give the credit where it belongs to Burton Gross and Dan Schankweiler, who's the legal staff that did most of the analysis on this. and. And on all of these proposals, but in particular related to the bylaws, um, they've analyzed the Public Utilities uh, Code Section 345.5 in detail, including its legislative history, as it could apply to the proposed bylaw provision. Um, we concluded, uh, me and my staff, that the proposed bylaw provision is consistent with the statute um, because it would be in the public interest by enabling closer regional integration and benefits California in that way. It's consistent with federal law and um, 
as applicable to the ISO and is otherwise consistent with, again, with the statute 345.5. Um, it's explained in more detail in Appendix A to the GRC's final proposal, which is available on the ISO's website, as you noted. And, and frankly, if anyone has any concerns, um, I'd be happy to chat with them or um, have them chat with my staff on that. But we're very comfortable with our findings. Thank you, Roger. Yeah, I'd just like to echo what Jan said um, and thank you for all the hard work and that, um, and especially in lieu of, of, of losing the leadership that you had. Um, uh, I, I also would like to just note that this document apparently is 126 pages and um, I, I did not realize that it had been posted on December 7th. And I would just like to ask maybe in the future, this could be included in our board packet because we would have read it or at least reviewed it before you gave this presentation. So I feel a little behind the curve here in terms of, of what is actually here. So Roger, we may have some questions for you. Yeah, absolutely. And happy to take those questions. Um, you know, the briefing is that it's a briefing. And so um, that's unfortunate. I'm sorry you didn't know that or we didn't um, make that clear. But nonetheless, we have time for questions. Um, not today, but we do have time for questions. And, and, and Roger, uh, on that note, I, I there's actually one more recommendation, <laughs> a couple more slides, and I promise oh, I can no. do it really fast. Oh, no, no. Um, OK, next slide after that. Um, so these are two really simple ones is that um, we are recommending, which we believe is tentatively proposed that um, the, that there should be, that the board and the body should exercise their joint authority over um, EDAM market design. So that would be your February 1st meeting. Um, and EDAM governance proposal would become effective once FERC has conclus conclusively accepted the ISOs Section 205 filing um, for the market design and um, your attorneys can um, let you know that that means like the final final from FERC. Um, but as we have experienced um, in the past with EIM, there's a lot of things moving in, in, in parallel, but that's when that's the official deadline um, or the official start date. Um, next slide. Um, just in terms of process, um, the GRC is convening on January 9th to um, do our final vote on, on this proposal. And um, we haven't had that, we haven't taken that option yet. Um, listening for additional feedback, especially from you all, which we will continue to, to take. And um, Governor Leslie, don't worry, that's the entire document is not that long. Um, the appendix is, is, is rather long um, just to, to make sure everybody has the same information at the same time. And now I am officially done and thank you all. Um, appreciate the opportunity and always enjoy working with the ISO. Yeah, I, I just requested it actually and, and maybe Stacey sent it to everyone in case they haven't seen it. I would assume all the board members would appreciate it. And I Thanks. just wanted to thank the GRC and to thank Rebecca who again, you know, cannot underscore enough that she's the greatest ISO volunteer of all time and started with a transitional committee and now the GRC and stepped into Teresa's role under very difficult circumstances and is doing a, a wonderful job shepherding this process along. It has been a flawless process, really well executed, very thoughtful with everybody's participation, um, making sure that the final outcome is in the best interest for the market and the greater West and all, st all stakeholders. And, uh, kudos to Jeff Nelson. He hit the ground running. He volunteered to do the presentation. He came in late into the process, but has been an invaluable member, just like with every uh, GRC member. Pam has been wonderful too. I'm sorry we lost her, uh, but you know she's at the Christmas party, so that's okay. <laughs> we can forgive her for for celebrating. And of course, Tony Brown is always available and and has been um, a very steady. Uh, uh, rudder on, on the ship and making sure that we don't go off course. So very happy and proud to have had the opportunity to observe how this body has, uh, how this committee has operated and, and, and the outcome and this, and this proposal as well. And very happy to have had the opportunity to continue to work with John Prescott as a non-body member from the governing body as well. 
and it's been it's been an honor to be a part of the process, honestly. Hey, Roger, this is Ash. I have a technical question. Um, is the GRC governance review um, proposal joint authority? That's a good technical question, and I think it is not. Um, because I think it's a delegation of authority from the Board of Governors, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think technically it was a, I, I have to look back at that. So, but I believe it was originally a board only, but then it, we made it a joint authority. So okay. I'm sorry, I don't have that at my fingertips at the That's moment. Right. I, I mean, and, and either is fine with me. I just want to make sure we're, we've. Yeah, we'll, we'll make eyes. sure of that. Yeah, so that's I'm getting I'm getting pinged right here by people that know more than me, and uh, yeah, the board, I was I was going to say Roger, I, it was going to be a joint decision. Sorry. It was determined to be a joint decision, so I will uh, confirm that right here. Sorry about the confusion. Nope. Good. It's Rebecca, okay. this is Rob, and and you know there's not enough time today to to express the the appreciation by the entire governing body, but but really. Thanks to you and Jeff and Pam and the entire GRC. It, it is greatly appreciated and, and there'll be more. Yeah, let, let me echo that too on, on our part and on the, you know, the legal group. And it's really been um, a pleasure to work with the, the GRC and, and my team has said nothing but great things about the whole process. Uh, let me at this point open up the line, see if we have any public comment for the um, Governance Review Committee's uh, briefing. If you do want to make a comment, you can actually press the raise hand icon at the bottom of the screen, or you can press pound two if you join via audio only. All right, let's go to the first caller in the queue, Doug Marker. You've been sent a prompt to unmute yourself. Please also remember to state your name and affiliation. Doug, are you there? Doug, your line is unmuted. Please make sure you are not double muted via your call-in number. All right, we'll move on. There are no further questions in the queue at this time. Okay, thank you. Okay. And Thank you, governing body and board. Um, thank you very much, Rebecca. And let's move on to our last item and uh, we see what we can do with that. I appreciate everyone's efforts to um, help us in this you know, very full discussion. So agenda item number seven is a briefing on transmission services and market scheduling priorities and day ahead market enhancement initiatives. That couldn't take too long. Uh, Anna, would you like to um, introduce it? I won't spend too much time in the interest of time. Milos will be presented to you the transmission service and market scheduling priorities, and then with whom I've introduced already. And then after that, Greg Cook will be uh, taking you through the Dayhead Market Enhancement Design, our Executive Director of Market Infrastructure and Policy Development here at the ISO. So with that, I will turn it over to Milos. All right, thank you, Anna. And uh, I'll be fairly brief. If we can go to the next slide. But just as a reminder, this is the initiative where we're uh, seeking to establish a, a more durable design for, for establishing wheeling through scheduling priority across the ISO system, particularly that high scheduling priority equal to load. What are the appropriate requirements for establishing that scheduling priority? We, the design that we currently have in place expires on June 1st, 2024. Um, and that's an interim design where effectively entities have to meet certain requirements, including a contractual requirement plus transmission to the ISO border if they're seeking to wheel through the ISO system, if they want to establish high scheduling priority uh, equal to, to ISO load. And what we're looking for is a design that moves away from this interim framework or something more durable. Um, and I'll just highlight it here on the next slide. Uh, we published our draft final proposal last Friday and uh, what we're proposing is to calculate how much transmission capacity is available at the ISO intertie uh, in order to allow entities that are seeking to wheel through the ISO system to reserve that transmission capacity in advance. And if they reserve that capacity in advance, then they can establish that 
uh, high scheduling priority for a wheel through that's equal uh, to load, such that when we get into more stress system conditions and there's limited capability for those transmission facilities to accommodate all the needs that those priorities come into play and, and that high priority wheel through has equal priority to ISO load. We would calculate this, what's wow. available. We would calculate that across a 13 month horizon in monthly increments and as well as in a daily horizon such that we provide entities the ability to reserve this ATC available transfer capability um, in those monthly increments across that rolling 13 month horizon, but also in the daily timeframes to the extent that there are unexpected system conditions that are materializing and entities need to depend upon wheel throughs through the ISO system to serve external load. Um, in calculating those native load needs, we would uh, also look to calculate, in calculating the, what's available, we would look to calculate um, how much transmission capacity do we need to set aside for native load needs. And we propose a design in the paper on how much capacity to set aside that really looks at historically, what has the ISO, uh, how much import supply has been contracted historically. And that is a representation on a going forward basis, how much transmission capacity to set aside at the inner ties for native load, along with some margins. And then the remainder is what's available to establish wheeling through scheduling priority. We're also introducing a process where to the extent that ATC is limited, to the extent that entities cannot access that, that transmission capacity, there's a process for where entities can submit longer term requests. If they want that higher scheduling priority for a year or longer in duration, they can establish a request that would be studied and uh, potentially may, uh, those entities may need to drive upgrades across the ISO system to establish that scheduling priority on a longer term basis and give them that certainty. So all in all, the design that we're putting forward provides the ability to access available transfer capability, what's available for wheel throughs on a short term basis in those monthly horizons across the 13 month time frame, as well as in the daily horizon. But we also then provide a pathway for establishing that priority on a long-term basis and potentially driving upgrades across uh, the ISO system. We think that the elements of the design that we put into the draft final proposal are within the general range of practices across the West. There's not a one size fits all how other entities do some of these aspects. The practices do vary, but we think that what we're putting forward is within that range of the practices that we've benchmarked. And we also recognize that certain aspects of this design account for some of the ISO unique market uh, needs and ensuring compatibility with the market. We look forward to continuing to work and engage with stakeholders on this design. And there's a, if we go to the next slide, there's a stakeholder meeting coming up on Friday where we're going to walk through this uh, draft final proposal and then stakeholder comments are due on January 4th. We're going to have a final proposal as well published on the 11th before taking this item to the board uh, for February decision. That's all I had on this item. We pause here for questions. Looks like Anita has a question. So not, not to spend a lot of time, Milos, but um, I do want to ask, um, this is, a, as you know, a very hot topic. And in terms of stakeholders generally, um, kind of where are stakeholders at this point? Is, 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 are we getting to them feeling satisfied with, with the direction or are there still going to be quite a bit of controversy? I think I think we'll know more here when we get to the to the meeting on the 16th and when the comments come in. But based on prior iterations of the proposal, I think stakeholders are generally coalescing around the overall framework where the devil is in the details of how do you calculate native load? Is that a reasonable approach that entities can get around uh, or can get behind? Recognizing that we may need to evolve that design uh, over time. But I think with the overall framework of calculating ATC and providing avenues to access that ATC across the 13 month horizon and the daily horizon. I think that's what entities uh, are supportive of, as well as uh, providing avenues to potentially uh, be studied and uh, pursue upgrades to the extent that they need to and having that option. Where I think we'll know more when we get into the discussion is on the details of how do you calculate native load and some of the other uh, more minute components. And we'll know that here on the 16th, as well as when the comments come in on, on the 4th. But, um, I think I think we're generally finding some coalescence around the overall framework. I agree with that, and I would just add, Anita, just as you saw, you know, I think I think the heat wave 
earlier this year was also, you know, a very insightful and I think galvanizing edge case where we were, particularly with respect to our colleagues in Nevada, able to honor those realtors doing very, during very stress grid conditions. So I think that was informative as well. So I think it's moving in the right direction and we're quite encouraged to the next round of conversations with stakeholders. So, so any I, other questions know, on this item for yeah, yeah I, just, ahead, I just know this is going to be a really key and critical issue and so I hope everybody gets a chance to to read the comments. Absolutely. Any other questions before we move to the final item? Okay. Thanks. So Anna, I know we're going to finish up with Dame. We, get, we are. We're going to finish up with Dame. Yeah. With yep, Dame, and in the interest of time, I suggest we have um, Greg go through his uh, presentation, and then perhaps if there are public comments, I believe there still needs a there may be public comments at the end. But let's have Greg go through his presentation first, and then we can take comments on the other on the two items. Okay. All right. Hey. Good evening. So okay, I, I'll try and go through this relatively quickly. This is a a preview of our day ahead market enhancements. Uh, this initiative is a long time coming. We started this back in. 2019 with the objective of being able to address the growing operational needs that are really being driven by more a more variable supply fleet with more wind and solar resources as also a more variable load with when we're seeing more rooftop solar being added on the system as well. So we had three primary objectives when we went into this initiative. One was to address that net load uncertainty between the day ahead and real time market. The second was to address real time ramping needs that are caused by steep differences between the 15 minute real time market intervals and the hourly day ahead market schedules. And then finally to ensure that those resources that are scheduled to meet those needs are deliverable and not stranded behind transmission constraints. So if we can go to the next slide. So our proposal does provide some enhancements to address that net load uncertainty. Uh, again, there's growing dependence on wind and solar resources and that's increasing the uncertainty and variability in the net load and system operators are having to manage a wide range of possible outcomes and this is creating an operational risk primarily because our day ahead market does not ensure that we have sufficient resources available to meet uh, those real time imbalance energy needs. So today to address this our system operators are having to rely on significant out of market actions to reserve additional supply in the day ahead market. And they're basically doing this by adjusting our residual unit commitment or RUC forecast, and at times by thousands of megawatts in order to commit additional resources for that day ahead to real time uncertainty and meeting those intra hour ramping needs. So we think, you know, based on that, it was clear that a new day ahead market product was needed that could procure those reserves in the day ahead prime frame. So we can go to the next slide. So what we're proposing is a new day ahead market product that we're calling the imbalance reserve product. And so imbalance reserves would be co-optimized with energy and ancillary services in the day ahead market. And we're doing this to optimize the unit commitment and assisting ramping capability. And this has some benefits that it will provide a, mar provide a marginal price signal to reflect the value of that flexible capacity where and when it's needed. And then we will also be able to optimize this product based on bidding costs and those bidding costs we would expect to reflect the resources cost of being available for real time market dispatch. So that could include such things as securing gas uh, transmission costs to reach the ISO border uh, setting up hydro systems or opportunity costs to sell in other markets after the day ahead market closes. Um, this new product is designed to ensure that the real time market again has sufficient ramping capability to respond to that uncertainty and variability. So the imbalance reserves are going to be procured on both an upward and a downward dispatch capability basis. And then the resources that are supplying this are qualified to provide the reserves based on whether they are 15 minute dispatchable and based on their 15 minute ramping capability. And um, Finally, the, the market will also ensure that the reserves are feasible and can be deployed. And we will do this uh, through running deployment scenarios to, in, in the event that the upward imbalance or downward imbalance were to occur to ensure that those resources are ultimately deliverable from a transmission perspective. Uh, next slide, please. 
So our, we're also including some enhancements to the residual unit commitment or RUC process. So, you know, as a brief reminder, RUC assures that there are sufficient physical resources online to meet our day ahead demand forecast. So the day ahead uh, financial market, which includes uh, virtual bids and bids from variable energy resources and is cleared on bid and demand, is then when we get into the RUC process, we replace the uh, the ver bids with their forecast output, as well as replacing that bid in demand with the forecast demand, and we remove the virtual supply and demand bids and reclear the market. So then the, the residual unit commitment can then uh, commit additional resources if necessary to ensure that we have sufficient physical resources to meet that day ahead load forecast. Um, but the imbalance reserves then would be procured above and below that day ahead forecast. And I do have an example on the next slide to show how these, how the residual unit commitment process and the new reliability capacity product will work with the imbalance reserve product. Um, the RUC will be also be enhanced because we will have the ability to procure both upward and downward dispatch capability. Today, RUC is designed only to meet upward uh, reliability requirements. So by committing, it can commit additional resources, but it cannot decommit resources in the event that the IFM were to clear above the day ahead forecast. And then finally, our design provides for RUC procurement to be competitive across the EDAM footprint. And we're doing this by allowing these uh, RUC uh, reliability capacity to be competitively bid into the residual unit commitment process. And we would include this for all resources, including resource adequacy resources, which today are required to provide a $0 availability bid into the residual unit commitment process. Uh, next slide. So here's a, a quick example of, of how the reliability capacity and the imbalance reserves are, are designed to work. So in, in this example, we have an example of um, imbalance reserves and reliability capacity when the day ahead market load forecast is greater than what was cleared in the uh, financial uh, market in the day ahead market. So here, the uncertainty uh, requirement is relative to the load forecast, not the IFM solution. So the reliability capacity is used to procure hourly dispatchable resources uh, up to meeting that load forecast. And then we procure additional 15 minute um, rampable resources as imbalance reserves uh, up, for, up to the meeting the upward uncertainty requirement. And then we also pr uh, procure that on a 15 minute from 15 minute dispatchable resources. Uh, in the downward direction as well. So you can see, and I think the important point here is that the imbalance reserves are really anchored you know, off of that load forecast, and then the reliability capacity is, is there to ensure that we do have those physical resources to meet the load forecast. And again, th that reliability capacity can be met by hourly dispatchable resources versus 15 minute dispatchable for the imbalance reserves. Uh, next slide, please. And so, you know, I think an important point to make is the imbalance reserve product is really critical for EDAM and it, and it unlocks a lot of the regional market benefits. Um, the imbalance reserve product provides for netting out of load, wind and solar forecast errors across the entire EDAM footprint. Plus it also provides geographic diversity, which reduces the day ahead imbalance reserves that each EDAM balancing area needs to procure to meet their individual uncertainty needs. So this larger footprint allows also allows for the more efficient selection of flexible resources, meaning that we can select those that have the lowest cost for providing that imbalance uh, energy into the real-time market. And this also has the benefit of providing confidence in EDAM transfers as those transfers are secure uh, as the load and supply variability has been accounted for through the imbalance reserve product. And then, you know, a point on this, we a recent EDAM benefits study conducted by energy strategies, we had them include a sensitivity study on the impact of the imbalance reserve product. And they found that the imbalance reserve product was responsible for 60% uh, of the EDAM operational benefits, just to show, you know, how critical this is to EDAM. Uh, next slide, please. And, you know, as this is a large comprehensive initiative, there's a lot of 
issues involved. We do have uh, a number of issues we're working through through the stakeholder process. We're, we're looking to wrap that up here shortly, but you know, here, this is kind of the list of sticky issues that we're we're still working on. Um, local market power mitigation for imbalance reserves and reliability capacity is an issue as we are trying to procure this uh, product locationally, and it does have interactions with energy prices. Um, there's an issue about accounting for energy costs and the balance reserve procurement. These are a little different than operating reserves that you know we seldom dispatch because the imbalance reserves will often be dispatched in the real-time market, and therefore the energy cost of the resource may need to be considered for efficient procurement. But again, that's something you know we're continuing to work on uh, through the stakeholder process. Um, we've had some suggestions that it might be. Uh, beneficial to start with zonal procurement over nodal procurement. And I think the primary benefit there would be to reduce some of the market power uh, concerns with the, with the new product. But again, on the other hand, that does not ensure that the deliverability of the imbalanced reserves, they could still be being procured behind transmission constraints under a zonal design. And then the interplay between resource adequacy capacity contracts and potential new market revenues and you know i'm going to spend a little extra time on this one we've been this has been a primary issue i, I think it's a big issue for the uh, investor-owned utilities as well as the um, cpuc and, and particularly the the cpuc asked um, to ask me to read the following statement so i'm going to do that on this issue and it's they essentially the cpuc staff remain concerned with several elements of the current uh, design. Most notably, they're concerned about the overlap between the purpose and cost of the proposed imbalance reserve product, which is included in the day ahead market enhancements proposal, and which may overlap or duplicate CPUC RA programs must offer obligation. The primary concern is the potential for double payment by the customers of CPUC jurisdictional load serving entities for these overlapping reliability tools. This is especially a concern for existing contracts with the CPUC has indicated a significant amount of which have entered into as a result of large amount of new resources ordered by the commission. And then given the uncertainty of the final specification of the imbalance reserve product, CPUC staffs believes that it's quite likely that many of these contracts, which will be in place for years to come, may not have clearly specified how to account for cost responsibility for the resource availability for the resource available as an imbalanced reserve product resource in light of the existing must offer obligation or who owns the imbalanced reserve product payments. So, you know, in response to this, um, we do believe that the per current proposal does provide um, some mechanisms for addressing this issue. We have agreed to provide additional information to uh, contracting parties that where the contract does specify how these revenues should be dealt with. And then we've also proposed a transition mechanism for where it hasn't been specified in those contracts. And, you know, we're committed to, you know, continuing to work with the CPUC staff uh, and to engage on further discussions to address these concerns as we move forward on the final proposal. Um, and then finally, um, there's imbalance reserve penalty prices is, uh, <laughs> we got moved ahead. Uh, can we go back one slide really quick? Um, the imbalance reserve penalty prices. Again, this is essentially establishing a demand curve for the procurement of the imbalance reserve product, and then also balancing the cost and rely. And this balances the cost and reliability trade-offs. And then finally, the the WAM governing body authority. So as we went through um, the proposal under the current uh, WAM governing body classification rules, most of the elements would fall under the governing body's advisory authority. There are a couple that we believe would have been joint. However, now if we can go to the next slide, we are recommending uh, the ISO Board of Governors consider an adjustment to the WAM governing body's role. Um, so we've had several stakeholders comments that have indicated that they would support joint approval for the entire proposal. Um, and so we think this is a, a reasonable consideration. However, you know, we have also received some some feedback that, and we want to clarify that if we do identify any item that is specific to California ISO balancing authority area reliability or operations, 
um, such and this could be such as a resource adequacy related rule that those would be treated separately and not included under joint authority. But that being said, we do believe that joint authority could be appropriate given the nature of the initiative. It is foundational to EDAM, which will be under joint authority. And uh, as I noted, the indirect balance reserve product drives a significant portion of the potential EDAM benefit. So again, I apologize for going through that so fast, but I know we're, we're late on the day here and I'll stop there and be happy to answer any questions. Final slide is just uh, the schedule that we have. We'll be bringing this to the, the joint uh, governing body and board for a decision at the February 1st uh, joint board meeting. And uh, again, happy to answer any questions. Like Mary has one. Mary, you have your hand. Yes, Roger, I would just like to say, Greg, thank you for that outstanding presentation. And we love this market enhancement and you're absolutely right. And um, uh, I just think that, that um, in Ash's absence, I just like to, to recognize that, that the board, the ISO board supports the, your recommendation. This should be a joint decision. Management's recommendation that this be a joint decision. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mary. Thank you. Yeah, and then Any other so questions? I also wanted to, Roger, I was just going to say, Please. Greg, thanks. And, and um, you know, it's been a, I'm glad you had the opportunity to, uh, to read the, the comment from, from the uh, PUC. Uh, the commissioners in particular and staff have been extremely constructively engaged on this process and feels like we're really getting to good answers to these questions. And so that's been a, important final step in resolution. So thanks for all the creativity there. And we're excited to get this product uh, approved and across the goal line. It's a key piece of the EDM value proposition. So thank you all. Okay. Thank you, Elliot. Boy, Roger, LFT Severance. Sever yes, yeah, so, and we get, we're we gonna do some public comment too. We wanna make sure the public has an opportunity. Yep. I'll, be, I'll be very quick. Um, I, I hope we can talk before we get the final about local market power mitigation and this idea of using zonal rather than nodal procurement. I thought we figured out a long time ago that doesn't really help. Um, they're, they're equivalent if there's no transmission constraint. And if there is a transmission constraint, they're just misleading. So um, I, I, I would like to engage on that before we get the final that does that. Okay. Can do. Okay. Operator, hopefully you all can hear me now. I understand I was um, uh, cutting out earlier, so I apologize for that and for my internet cable provider. Um, but if the operator could um, check for public comment, I would appreciate that. If you would like to make a public comment, please press the raise hand icon on Zoom located at the bottom center of your screen or you can dial pound two on our phone only line. Moving to the first caller in queue, you have been sent a prompt to unmute yourself. Please remember to state your name and your question. Hi, this is Carrie Bentley. I represent the Western Power Trading Forum. Uh, we care about transparency and market principles. Um, so like many stakeholders, we support the day ahead market enhancement dame and concept, but strongly oppose the specific design um, as it is in the draft final proposal. I, we just wanted to give everyone a heads up and I'm going to be so brief. Um, we will send a letter. I'm sure many stakeholders will send a letter, but when reading these, I just wanted to ask the board to keep in mind that if the energy market transacts $1 billion a month, the 900 million of this is in the day ahead market. So I didn't want you guys to be surprised by how vehemently we feel about this. I um, mean, it really is because it's impacting the day ahead market, which does transact the bulk of the energy revenues. So compromises and risks that really we might be okay with in the real time market, we feel are just too impactful when you're talking about radical day ahead market changes, especially ones that will be implemented concurrent with EDAM. Um, I'll note that we do support the KISO's proposal related to RA being separate from the co-optimized imbalance product, um, and we do support the goals of this initiative. Um, we really just have a problem with how complex it is and ultimately how that will impact the day-ahead market incentives. Um, so we look forward to working with you all further on this. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Carrie. You, Carrie. Thank you, Carrie. There, 
Any other um, callers, operator? There are no other callers in the queue at this time. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. We, you know, actually, given some time constraints, we didn't come too far over. Um, but I'm happy to announce that I think at this point, and unless the board and the governing body have any other things to say, that we can adjourn. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, Take care. See you soon. Thanks. Thank okay, you. See you tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah. See you tomorrow. Yeah. That concludes today's conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.